we are dedicating this episode to our friend Jeff Pettit, who recently passed away. Um, this isn't easy for me to do, but I think it's important. Um, I have uh, Ray Simmons here with me, who the episode will be with. And actually, Jeff Pettit was very instrumental in connecting Ray and I so that we could do this interview. I actually just talked to Jeff June 2nd, according to my phone, and we were exchanging old photos and laughing it up. And dude, if you didn't know, was pretty much the life of the party, no matter what party he was at. He, he just brought this an amazing energy and spirit and good vibes. He uh, shared a part with Ray and Shackle Me Not and uh, later became a pro snowboarder. I met him in Tahoe with Pat Duffy. You know, they all grew up in Marin. And uh, anyhow, we're going to do our best to kind of just give a little shout out, tribute, and much love to um, Jeff. He's going to be missed. Uh, our thoughts are with his family and friends. Ray, how are you? Pretty good. Thanks, Schmitty, for doing this. I'm still in shock, but I appreciate you doing this. Yeah. What do you remember? You must have met him super early in your life, yeah? Yeah. So I also want to uh, thank Joel Rona, who has a much better memory than I do. Okay. Uh, I talk to Joel a lot. Uh, we've been like, we've talked more in the last couple days or few days than in the last 10 years probably. But mm -hmm. uh, um, I, was, I was trying to remember when we first met Jeff and I thought it was at San Rafael High School. There was like a, it, we didn't really have like demos. There was these weird skate bashes, but people would put up a poster like, you know, skate bash at this school and people would bring a bunch of jump ramps and pieces of plywood and put picnic tables out. So I remember skating there and seeing him there and seeing him jump over uh, a picnic table with like a street ramp or something. Um, that's kind of, that's what I roughly, roughly remember. But uh, Joel remembers going, there was another one of these things at the civic center, Marin civic center. Huh. And, um, he met a guy named Joel Doherty there. And this was a funny tale because he said that Joel's like, Jeff wasn't there, but Joel's like, you got to meet Jeff. He, he's like, he's got a skate park at his house and he's been training. <laughs> That's what he said. Wow. And it was true. Jeff had a ton of ramps. We were always over at his house. He had like, uh, he had these great little dinky jump ramps, which were good for putting up on walls, like sticking in your car and taking places. And then he had massive jump ramps for jumping over cars and stuff. Nice. So, and rails. He had rails. He had everything. So we were over at his house a lot. And, and do you have any, uh, it, do you know why he had the elbow pad around his ankle? Was, was that for style or was that for function? Or in, in the video part, he's, he's, I think he's at, uh, in SF skating. And he's got the elbow pad down around his ankle on one one foot only. Yeah, it's pretty funny. I I also would sport that look sometimes. And I think we both, I don't know, I remember for me, I used to always slam. Like I, if I do something and then uh, catch up, hang up somewhere, I would always slam on the same elbow over and over and over again. So I would put it on my elbow if I thrashed myself. And I think Jeff would do the same thing. You know? Oh, so it was so kind, it was of, kind like of carrying it until you needed it. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. I mean, my elbow one time was like a giant balloon because I had hit it so many times. Right. So um, I thought about an early memory I had of meeting him, and it was up in Tahoe, and it was the winter time, and we were at um, – we were in Squaw at some party, and I think Duffy had given us directions or something because they were living up there, and we met over there. And there's this guy in the back of the house, and he's sitting on top of the dryer, and both feet are hanging, and he's just kicking the shit out of the dryer, like, ba 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 over and over for nonstop. 
I'm like, who the fuck is that dude? And later I got introduced to him and it was Pettit. <laughs> so that's like a, that's definitely an early memory for me of meeting him. And he didn't, um, he didn't let me down every, every time therefore after, like he was always, you know, I'd see him at the bar, or I'd see him skating or whatever. And he just always had a smile and always wanted to catch up and, he, you know, he had that sincere heart, like, that was just really, really cool. And one other thing I wanted to share is that one of my good friends, Dan Drahobel, his wife went on her bachelorette party, and the, her and the girls went up to Reno, and uh, Jeff gave her a heart tattoo, a black heart tattoo, and all the girls got black heart tattoos. So they became the black heart tattoo crew from that trip. And uh, so that's like a real special bond and connection as well. Um, is there anything, I mean, I'm sure you have endless stories, but is there something in particular maybe you could share? Yeah, there's tons of stories. I had, uh, so some of the stuff I wanted to say was, you know, that Jeff was a super generous guy, like, in thinking back on all the times we did stuff, uh, we were always over at his house. Like he was, he was very generous in that way that he didn't mind having everyone at his house all the time. Uh, we'd stay over at his house and do stuff. Uh, and also when we traveled to do things like, uh, his dad took us to Visalia skate camp. Uh, we stepped, stayed, I think we stayed with Jeff's sister down in Santa Clara when we went to, the skate, to, the skate camp down there, which was the first time we started filming for Shackle Me Not, was we just showed up at that skate camp. Um, so he was always, you know, and we, we always used all his ramps and everything. Like, he was just super generous that way. And, and uh, you know, he was always in a, uh, you know, a good mood and trying to get, and he was also always trying to get keep people in a good mood too people are getting irate or pissed off about stuff You're like, come on, you guys. He was always like, come on, you guys, let's have fun. Like, yeah, chill out, you know, Absolutely. Uh, I think the, uh, so, so someone mentioned that, uh, I should say something about, um, that scene in shackle me not where the big fat hairy dudes yelling at him. Right. <laughs> He's, you know, He's like, fuck off, man. Yeah. Like, I, I, come so here, I was, kid. Yeah, come here, kid. <laughs> Look at that fucking fat. <laughs> that, that was just classic. I was not there. And uh, I think it's Jerry Thompson, one of our friends, is in the back row going, come on, come on, do something or something. Yeah. But, uh, you, know, Jerry, you know, Jeff was going to back down if there was an asshole involved. But generally with all of us, he was, he was trying to keep the peace, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> so Fuck. but but he had like he also had like uh crazy parties at his house. He had a crazy birthday party where he had I don't know, I may be getting this wrong, but I thought he had a clown come and he had Arge Barker. I don't know if you remember that comedian, but he knew Arge and Arge came and, and did like a whole set. We were all cracking up. <laughs> Should look no him way. up. He's a pretty funny dude. Oh, wow. uh, but like that was insane. Like who, I just, who has a party with a comedian that comes? <laughs> yeah. So that was, that was pretty damn funny. You know, we used to go up to Tahoe too and, and hang out. That was really fun. And I don't remember where we stayed. I just remember that his parents were always helping us do fun stuff. You know, Q was super cool, dude. His dad. I mean, he was getting on handrails pretty early in life. He was board sliding the handrail on that part, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through the, the one Duffy Beck Smith at uh, SF State. Oh, yeah. He did the kink one. He did the long ass one. Yeah. Uh, when we were in Santa Clara, uh, that long handrail, there was barely any room to get started on that handrail. So, so I 50 50 that one, and he, and he board slid that thing. Right. Um, I think there's a, there's a, in the in the slam section, there's me trying to board slide it, and it looks like my foot broke off. Uh, but that was a tough railing, you know. And he hammered that out. Um, and I was trying to remember when we first did handrails, but I mean, 
it was early. We never saw anyone else do a handrail. I think we, Duffy said you were the first person he ever saw do one. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I know, I know, I think we did Ross post office. I think that was the first handrail. And I remember when we looked at it, cause we had board slid other things, blocks and stuff and benches. Uh -huh. But I remember looking at it and thinking, uh, you know, is my leg going to go through the hole and get caught up in the rail, which I never worried about on like, like other stuff. So we used to session that little railing. And there were some other ones in, in San Rafael that were really tiny where you could just 5-0 grind it. Right. Like super small, like two stairs, you know, but it was something you could start on. Uh, uh -huh. But I was trying to place the date on that. It was at least 86, but it, I, Damn. I'm pretty sure it was at least 86, but it could have been earlier. I don't know. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. It was, but I know we never saw anyone else do it. We just said, hey, you know, now we can ollie, let's see. And Jeff was always into the kinky ones too. Like he was always looking for the weird kinked railing or the one that was in Chackle Knot. It like kinks down, then goes flat and then kinks down. Yeah, that's the I thing. I ollied over it. And that, that was, was in Sarah Fell. Fell. Yeah. Yeah. And he just, he cleared the first half and then landed in the middle part <laughs> so he could avoid the kink. I think uh, there's a shot of in Hocus Pocus, the slam section of Gabe Morford trying the really this really weird one in Corte Madera that was all curvy kinks no way yeah I think yeah. Jeff did that one but you had to like you know lumpity lump get down it is it shackle me not where it has that little song it's like Ray Simmons Jeff 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 Pettit Ray 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 Simmons or something. yeah so they had dubbed over a bunch of stuff for that video I think it was Ternaski and I don't know who else they, they created all those songs and, like, made all that stuff up. Maybe and Jeff Clint? Knew Jeff Clint was probably involved. He was mm -hmm. creative like that. But I remember those guys telling me that they're like, hey, you guys, you're, Jeff, you, you and Jeff are going to love your part, dude. We, we, uh, we shout you out in it or something. And we're like, okay. But then it turned out to be like, like it, really, uh, it really stuck with everyone. You know, to this day, people are like, Ray Simmons, Jeff Pettit. You know, it was pretty funny. <sighs> I'm going to read our last little back and forth. He said, Gabe definitely has footage of the ski jump he built through the orange tree at his parents somewhere. How about the cruise control he made for the Valiant with a broomstick? But Ray did say, screw you guys quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> he used an inner tube wrapped around his board to assist with jumping stairs for the first year he was skating. He was the first to stack picnic tables. He's been freezing hydrogen atoms to negative 400 degrees Kelvin for the last 20 years in hopes of creating the first subatomic switch. I think that started with his thesis at Berkeley. That was Jeff Pettit when I asked him to give me some info before interviewing you. Those were his notes. No way, dude. That's so funny. <laughs> That's crazy. Joel, Joel reminded me of that inner tube thing. That was before we knew how to ollie. Ah. We, we're, we were weird. We called it the Bach for some reason. We would wrap the inner tube around our board. Yeah. Did you guys ever do this in the city? Yeah. I lived in the peninsula a little further down, but we did definitely did do that. Yeah. We, we loved the to catamaran too, where you, you had two, you know, you each got on your butt and faced each other and kind of put your legs over each other and like went down holding hands for turning. Yeah. 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 We used we to used do, that, to do that too. Yeah. We used to also bomb hills, pretty stupid, but we'd bomb hills laying down on the oh. board on our back like luge so feet we first. thought with feet first right yeah like we, did. we were luging yeah. and just go like super fast did but, you guys ever get you know. the glove and do the layback slides like the with the we, uh the tape and everything yeah we did that for a little while early like way early on before we knew yeah. how to do much of anything else All uh, right. i think joel's quote was once I saw Arco ollie off the stairs, I was like, forget the inner tube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, shout out to Arco. I did text with Duffy and 
obviously he's, you know, dealing with this, how he's dealing with it. He's probably, he's over in Finland and it's, I can only imagine they were very close. Um, and he kind of suggested possibly doing like a full episode about Jeff, maybe later on when people have time to grieve a little and maybe we could get like a big zoom of all, all these people that knew Jeff and share stories and, and have something kind of cool that could take up the whole episode. But I just, I felt it really important to get back together and, and just give a shout out to um, Jeff and his close friends and family that are hurting out there. Um, yeah, man, big love from, from me for sure. Yeah. Big shout out to Jeff. I also have, uh, I have that one, I have one other story I wanted to say it about Jeff being super generous. And that was um, this, uh, we're in surf sports contest that we had. Um, like I always sucked in contests. I couldn't do anything. I would always fall and never land anything. But anyway, Jeff was pretty damn, he was really good at competitions and he got pretty into it. And um, we had this one contest in Marine Surf Sports. I think it was 1987. And uh, we were all skating. We all start out as a big group, and everyone does their their session. So I, I think my first session, I did pretty well, and I made it through the first cut. And then there was another cut, and somehow it got down to the point where it was like uh, Noah Slaznik and I. Hmm. And what's funny is Aaron Vincent and Noah Slaznik always destroyed these street competitions, even though they were vert skaters. Yeah. Because they would totally kick ass flying off all these quarter pipes and do all this great vert stuff on small ramps. Yeah. Uh, and Noah Slaznik could, you know, he could do board slides down rails and grinds and everything. For some reason, I just, it sticks out in my head because Jeff got super pumped that I actually made the cut for anything. And he was like, dude, he came over to me. He's like, dude, you're going to win this thing. <laughs> I was like, all right, whatever. He's like, I'm going to tell you what to do. He's like, you got to go over here and you kick flip off this thing. And then you're going to do, do your grind down the rail over here. And then you're going to launch over the ramp. And he like totally laid out my whole plan. And he's, and during the practice session, he was running around going, okay, do this, do that. And I was landing this and doing that, he set it all up. And then it came time for the real thing. And he was over me, pumping me up. And then I went and started doing my, uh, my run. And he was running around the course yelling at me. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember I did some weird tuck knee thing and my foot came off like I was all wacko in the air. And I just threw it under me and made it. And he's like, yes, come on, dude. And somehow I made it through the whole run and made everything. And then I beat out Noah Slaznik and he was like, yes, he was so happy. And he was just like super joyed. And I was like, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for like, totally pushing me dude you know it was it was super generous and nice of him and it was unexpected too rad i always appreciated that cool well for um sure. thanks for sharing um some stories with us and then also i'm super down to at a later date get everyone together and and maybe have a little more jolly uh you know sharing stories or or whatever um if people yeah, are up I mean, for that i'm down for sure I think it would be cool. The, the, uh, you know, I hung out with Jeff pretty much through my high school years. And then he went down to San Diego after school. I went down and visited him once there. And, um, and then after that, uh, I moved to Santa Barbara. I didn't see him as much. He got really into all the snowboarding stuff. Uh, and I think I was asking Pat if he knew some, some of the snowboarding people that would really remember all those years. Right. You know, I'm so. sure we could dig up some people. I know a few people that were up there living up there at that time and stuff too. Yeah. Rest in peace, Jeff Pettit. The next part of the show is going to be a little more uplifting and fun. So sorry to start out on a downer, but uh, I just felt it necessary. Also, I do want to just mention that I've lost two of my better friends to drinking and driving car accidents and once my head wrapped around everything that had happened, I just really can't emphasize enough 
to not drink and drive, to not get in a car with someone that's drinking and driving. If you need to get Uber and it costs a lot of money, believe me, you'll be happy you spent the money. This is no joke. I just can't stress it enough. You just can't do it. Don't drink and drive. Big love to everybody, and I'm going to throw a little something fun for us all to transition. This is Ray Simmons, and you're talking to Schmidt. So you're (laughs) – this is Ray Simmons, and you're listening to Talking Schmidt. It's cool, like tonight is the night. Here we go again. Just give it the old cause turn, isn't it? All big dogs in. Schmitty. 96 times, Schmitty. Thanks, Schmitty. We on? Schmitty. Talking Schmidt. That's called going to the hospital, bitch. I'd be <laughs> shitting my pants. Glad. Your Rolodex is fucking deep. It's right. about the one, the one, the one. Who is this guy? Thinks he's tough shit. What's up? We're tastemakers. Come on, Schmitty. What the fuck? Let's hear it for Greg Smith. Yeah! Hello, test one. Hello, test two. This is part two, and we got Ray Simmons back with us with a little lighter conversation this time. What's up, Ray? How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Awesome. Get yourself a real microphone. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing the... So had to switch gears. I hadn't been doing any of these not in person. So when the pandemic hit, it was like, oh, shit. But it's kind of cool because it gives me an opportunity to reach people that couldn't be in my radius. Yeah, yeah. So I know it's it's. I've been doing all work stuff over over crazy, my laptop man. too. Yeah. You know, it's crazy times. Yeah, I know crazy stuff going on in San Francisco right now. Oh fuck! It's nuts. Yeah, I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know even what to say or how to do anything right now. It just seems like the best thing to do is kind of just listen. Yeah, that's for sure. I'm trying to uh, make the light a little better in here. So it's cool that you c- reached out to me. Uh, I think Joel Rona sent me some funny picture of me saying that uh, Pat was uh, Pat wanted a funny photo of me or something. Oh, but- Brad. I was asking him how this even uh, got started. He said there was some Instagram posts or something. I don't do any Instagram, so. Actually, um, I've been doing this podcast for like, uh, this is the second year, um, and I've been doing it every Tuesday. And uh, one of the things early on, I didn't know how long I was going to do this for, but uh, one of the things that drove me was like, one of my friends, Rob, I was like, hey, will you do it with me? And he's kind of a passive guy, doesn't like to talk about himself and whatever. He's like, I'll do uh, episode 69. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, then I guess I got to do at least 68 of these. <laughs> so I get to 69 and or 67-ish probably, and he starts having anxiety and he starts texting me and calling me. And I was like, you know what, I, I know, I know, but I just, I don't. I don't want to do this. Right. I was like, that's fine. I don't want you to be uncomfortable or like, you know, whatever. But I was like, who are some of your top three dudes that you would want or females or like, who would you like to have me? Who would you want to hear, you know, interviewed? And you were one of the top three people actually. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. So he's like a big fan, like uh, the early H street, like it was a, you know, such a pivotal, influential video um, all the way around. And uh, I think the fact that you grew up, did you grow up in in Marin and in North Bay? Yeah, just that. And then your ties to Duffy, who's him and Duffy were in a band together. So and Pat's just like the best. He's such a huge like wow, what a groundbreaker he was. And oh, then for yeah. Pat to talk about you so highly, it was like, we got to talk to this guy. And I really thrive off like um, talking to people that aren't, I mean, Eric Costin, we kind of know your story, right? Like it's like everybody's interviewed you. And I feel like I don't know a whole lot about you except for what I saw in that early video and what Pat's told me. I was like, that'd be great to catch up and kind of just hear some of your story and hear what it was like back then and whatnot. Yeah. I was thinking about H Street and one of the cool things about H Street was um, 
you know, they got a lot of people on their team that had been on other teams, but never really got promoted. Uh, I think Matt Hensley was on vision. Uh, Ron Allen, I, I can't remember if Ron Allen was also on vision, but they sort of didn't do anything with them, kind of. I don't know if, I don't know the full story about it, but I'm not sure. It seems as though they just didn't get promoted. Mm-hmm. And H Street was, I remember that their whole thing was, uh, they just really liked what you were doing. It didn't matter who you were, what your style was, or what you were wearing, or any of that stuff. It was, was what you were doing hard? Was it, you know, was, was that a non-trivial trick? What are you doing? You know, and if it was really interesting, they thought this guy's awesome or right. this girl's awesome, whatever, you know, they, they, it wasn't about your mystique or your style or any of that stuff. And I really appreciated that. They were just like, what do you, what's the next level? What are you going to do? Huh. You know, how can you push it? Right. And to turn was always trying to get us to do he didn't really know exactly what the next level was at that time. Yeah, you know, he had only been skating for not that long, I think. Because um, from what I understand, he wasn't a skateboarder. He he went to, I mean, originally, he went to uh, Visalia Skate Camp, I believe, or something with a friend and, and saw what was going on and was like, I need to be a part of this. And that kind of sparked him into like, he was already documenting things, but maybe BMX or something at that time. And then he dove into it. Yeah. Yeah. I had heard that. Um, the story he told me was that, uh, there was something to do with San Luis Obispo. I can't remember, but he met Tony Magnuson at some sort of, uh, I think it was a demo or something. And Ternaski was studying business. And I think he just got enthralled in skateboarding somehow and uh, thought this is a, this, you know, this is a great, uh, this is a great sport. And, and uh, I don't know why he thought he could really uh, make a difference or, or make an impact, but he struck up friendship with Tony and then they just got totally into it. That's what, uh, that's what I had heard. I think that the demo may have been at San Luis Obispo. I, I, Huh. But I'm not sure. So did he and Tony start H Street together or was H Street already started and then he jumped on board? Well, I think Tony had a company. I think that Tony already had something going. Uh-huh. But then when Mike, Mike was talking to Tony about it and I think he was like, hey, we should try this and we should do that. He was just super motivated to, uh, to push everything to the next level all the time. Okay. Uh, so I think he kind of really juiced things up and, uh, and then they came up with the name 8th Street. And uh, I mean, you should do an interview with Tony actually. And, and uh, Yeah, I'd like to. I did one with Ron and that was amazing. It was so cool. All the stuff he kind of educated me about with like, even just like the, the video title Shackle Me Not, where it originated and like how much ron actually had a lot to do with a lot of these creative things and stuff and him and clint and all that stuff was just i was just eating it up i was loving it yeah real cool stuff. yeah yeah ron i mean uh i got on h street i was gonna try to get a, a picture behind let me grab a picture that's pretty funny oh wow wow you see that yeah <laughs> who shot that photo Let's see, is Gabe in the picture? I think it was Gabe Morford. Oh, probably, huh? Is, yeah. is that it's kind of blurry, but is that is that Ron? No. This is all the local guys from our area. Okay. Jeff Pettit's there. No way. <laughs> Joel Rona's in the back. Yes. Uh, I'm back here. This is Mark. <laughs> so it was is our local skate crew. Ah. And uh <laughs> it's pretty funny because uh you know, we were always getting hassled by the local cops. Uh, Amazing. You know, as yeah, usual. we all were. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, not, not having a skate park, you know, now I can't believe how everyone has a skate park. There's skate parks everywhere. Yeah, it's incredible. Like, you know, for us. So, I mean, people. I got what I was going to say was I, I was, you know, I was, sk- I was skating in Oakland Tech, and that's how I met Ron Allen. Actually, I met him, I think I met him at the Embarcadero first, and he said, you should come to Oakland and skate Oakland Tech. And then we went over there and met up, and it was like a massive day of skating. I mean, I 
I, uh, I remember coming home, I was all bloody and super dirty and I got home super late and, um, my mom was yelling at me about how, how I looked, how I was all beat up and dirty. Yeah. And it was super late. It was like, I got home at 9 PM or something. And Ron had just called me up on the phone and he was like, Hey, do you want to ride for, uh, I want to sponsor you and send you boards. So I had my mom yelling at me. <laughs> You know, degrading me, like super mad at me. And I had Ron telling me he was going to give me boards. And I was so excited. I was like, wow. I mean, Wait. I just beat the crap out of myself doing all these railings and skating curbs and doing just skating with him all day long. Uh, right. A few of us went over there and I what was year super was that? beat up. That was, like I think 80s? it was 1987. Oh, 87. Okay. I think it was 87. It was 87 or 88. Somewhere hmm. in there. Um, okay. Well, let's. Um, can we rewind just a little bit? Well, you were yeah. born. Were you? You were born in uh, North County in North Marin. Or where were I you? was born in San Francisco, actually. In <laughs> My girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, NSF. Yeah, yeah. In San Francisco, my parents lived in San Francisco till I was around uh, one and a half or so, and then they moved out to Marin to a little town called Kenfield. Oh, in Kempfield, nice. Yeah. And then when did you get into skateboarding? How, when was your first board? So my first board, there was a little skate shop called Outdoor Skates in Kenfield. Oh. Wow. Uh, it was a little hole in the wall spot. And uh, I started skating with, I borrowed people's boards. Like in, um, I think it was, I think it was probably sixth grade or something, middle school, just starting middle school. I mean, when I was a little, little kid, I had one of those little uh, yellow banana boards that was plastic. Yeah, same. And, and mostly what I did was um, either have someone tow me with a rope behind a bike, or there was a really steep hill and I used to sit on it and drag the tail until it would melt the <laughs> tail and then smell it. Rad. <laughs> I wasn't doing anything else. It was just screwing around, you know? Yeah. Uh, but then when I got to middle school, I started borrowing people's skateboards. So then I went to this skate shop, Outdoor Skates, and they had a used board for 25 bucks. It had Bennett Victor trucks on it, and it was smaller. You know, it wasn't like the, the bigger board, the big, fat, modern 80s boards that were coming out. Uh -huh. I can't even remember the deck now. I can't, I'm trying, I think it was Bennett Victor deck. I think it was all Bennett Victor. Oh, okay. It had stripes on the bottom. Was it like a wood one that had like grip on it already that was like kind of carved out with the name in it? Uh, I think so. And it had okay. like a red and a green stripe. Okay. And it had a strip of grip tape on the top. And then it had Bennett Victor Tux. I wish I took a picture of that thing. But that was 25 bucks. That was what I could afford. And, uh, and I rode that thing for a while um, until I could earn some money so I could... Uh, uh, I started working at a cafe when I was like 13 doing dishes and stuff. And then I was able to buy, uh, I got a, one of those Sims boards. It was bright green with the green and black yeah. wheels. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, this the, board's so cool. The B-52s, right? <laughs> yeah. Those were my first wheels, black and purple. Yeah, those were so great. I, yeah. uh, I was so excited to get that two -tone. board. Two-tone, yeah. The two-tone. Right. Um, so yeah, I started skating around just around Kenfield, and uh, and then Joel Rona is. is uh, do you remember Joel? He's in the Eight Street video. He's the guy that does the big railing and then bounces off the wall. Yeah, he, he was sponsored by Tommy Guerrero for a while. Uh huh. Um, I I've known him since kindergarten. Okay. Um, so we started skating a lot, and we we skated a lot around College of Marin and jumping off these stairs, and we didn't know how to ollie. So we would find places where the stair had a little step, like just before the stairs, there'd be a little place where the cement went down and we'd ride along and then hit our back trucks on that little thing. So we could launch a little bit because we didn't know how to ollie. And then we could, when we found stairs like that, we tried to find longer and longer stairs where we had enough of a little, you know, kick oh. that we could actually pop our way and make it farther down the stairs so we just would go around that college and look for fun stuff to ride and were you kind of aware of skateboarding outside your bubble like did, did you guys know about the magazine and and stuff like did you know there was pros out there and that kind of stuff or were you just doing your own thing 
at first we had no idea. We were just like in like the things I was on. We were first jumping off stairs and riding around. We didn't we didn't really know anything. What what educated me actually? What I started to really kind of know what was going on was I would go hang out at outdoor skates, and they had a TV in there, and they would play videos.、Uh-huh. Um, and I remember seeing the early Powell videos. Right.、Um, and I remember I distinctly remember being in that shop. Totally clueless, you know. We just rode around and did stuff, and I remember seeing Tony Hawk do a a finger flip, flip his board with his fingers at Del Mar, and I got chills. I was like, "Oh my God, the guy's gonna die!" <laughs> I, when he started flipping the board, I was like, "Oh," because I had no idea how did you bail if you fall, <laughs> you know? How do you not kill yourself? I had no clue, so I was just like.、Oh! I was like, I couldn't believe it. Then he grabbed the board and came in, and I was like, Oh my god! I was so excited. I was、yeah. like, This is insane. And then there were no. We didn't really have.、Uh, we tried to look for pools and stuff, but there weren't a lot of pools around or or ramps. Later on, we started making ramps and stuff. But I think watching the videos was the first way I got really kind of educated that there was this whole deal. And then all the guys at the skate shop, of course, the outdoor skate shop. Mm-hmm. You know, they were older. We were like, we looked up to them. They had all their boards and all their stuff. What、um, was the vibes like in there? Were were they like, kind of assholes a little bit, like to give you tough love on what not to do and what to do, like teaching etiquette, or or n- not so much? They were kind of, you know, I would just say they were just sort of having a good time. They kind of acted really cool. That's all I remember is they were、mm-hmm. like. You know they were cool, but they were nice enough to be like, "Hey, this is how you should do your grip tape."、Right. You know, they would show us how they're, you know, cutting the grip tape or filing it off when they start filing it off the side of the board instead of cutting it. Yeah, and uh, uh, how to put bolts on and trucks.、Um, right. How to deal with your bearings. So they were pretty nice, but they definitely kept their cool. You know, they're in the know kind of. Deal, but they they were definitely they were smart about business. They wanted us to come back and and buy stuff, so they liked having all these kids coming over. And I th- I remember it was right next to right next to the building. It was weird. It was like the building was below the sidewalk. You had to go downstairs to get to it.、Huh. And next door, I think there was a hair salon or something. And sometimes they get irritated because we would all just sit outside the shop or be in the shop was really small. Mm-hmm. So if a ton of kids were there, we were even on the steps and stuff, and they're like, "Hey, come on, you guys!" So it was a super cool hangout. Like they were very, they definitely、uh, were nice enough because they wanted the kids to be around and watch the videos. And, and I think the owner, she was pretty nice. I think it was a woman. I、oh. vaguely remember her. she was pretty nice. She wasn't there all the time. It was mostly the, the you know, the guys running the shop. That shop so, doesn't exist to this day, does it? No. No, it's long, long gone. They got the、uh, what's that? There's another one like south of there、uh, with the ramp in the backyard. I forget the name of it. But they have like a whole skate park actually indoors at the. It's right off the 101.、Um, oh, really? When you're going to Muir Woods、wow. Proof Lab, I think it's called. Yeah. Wow. I, I think it's Mill Valley, maybe is the city. I'm not super versed with all those different little towns. Like, yeah. Blend into each other, but yeah. yeah. I、huh. mean. This one, yeah. When you come down the 101, and you you know you pass Mill Valley, and then you pass Corte Madera, and then when you hit Greenbrae, there's Larkspur, then Greenbrae, and then you take Sir Francis Drake down. That kept going all the way、uh, through Greenbrae, then Kenfield, then Ross, then San Anselmo, then Fairfax. Like there's all these little towns in there, right? And.、Uh, You know, at that time, I don't think there were a lot of skate shops. It's kind of nice that that skate shop was very, very close to College of Marin, where we would skate, and it was really close to my middle school,、uh, wow. and a great Mexican place called Taqueria, where we'd always eat. It was like、Rad. the best food ever. So we would just hang out there, like in our the very small little、uh, ecosystem. It was just great. Tons of stuff to skate. Lots of little curb things to jump. And、uh, loading docks to drop off—that was another fun thing to do. So that was your main local、uh, place to go shred. Yeah, that's、okay. right. We would just go down there every day. And then when you met Ron Allen, you were like, "How old were you at that point?" Yeah, by that time I was seventeen. Did、so、you 
know Gabe and Pat and them already and Jeff? Yeah. So, okay. so Gabe, Gabe grew up in Fairfax. Uh-huh. Uh, he went to uh, a different high school. Um, it's kind of funny because, you know, as things progress, like Joel and I started off skating in the beginning in our little local spot. And we were pretty young, right? We we're sixth grade or something in middle school. As right. we started to get older and learn more tricks and learn more about what was going on, you know, we started to go out. We, like we heard that there was this cool school called Drake that had a huge cement bank with blocks on top. Oh. And so we went over there and started skating that. I think that might be where I first met Gabe. And then Jeff Pettit was in San Rafael. He was in a completely different area. Um, so I think I met Gabe Morford and like some of uh, his buddies over there. And then we all started skating together. Um, and then I met Jeff later. And I, I'm trying to even remember. I don't even remember where I first met Jeff. You know, there, there would start to be uh, – skate demos and things because a local surf shop marine surf sports started sponsoring people for skateboarding and putting on like skate shows and demos and things so that was another way things got a little expanded and we also had the other thing that was really cool was there was a guy who made films that i'm not going to remember his name um who used to go to the san francisco and film tommy guerrero and jim thebo and all those guys Mm -hmm. and he would take the film and show it at college of marin at a theater there so he would come and and he would show that video in marin and then all the marin kids would come there and that was another way we would all get to see each other and like be like who's that guy and what's this person doing um i remember when we were really young and we had one of those movies come and Joel and I were like, yeah, we're going to, we started riding off all the steps that were right in front of the theater. And people were like, whoa. Um, and that was one of the first places I ever saw a four, we called it a forward Ollie. After one of those movies, you know, Tommy Guerrero would come and Thebo came. I, I think the first wall ride I ever saw was Jim Thebo. And I had what was blew my mind. He went up to a wall and rode up and down it. And I was like, what in the hell? And then I, maybe I saw Tommy do an ollie first, which we called a forward ollie because we had only seen people like whip their board 180 and get oh, okay. off the ground. Yeah. Uh, and it looked like magic. I think we saw it in the video too. Someone ollied up a, a bench and I was just like, what the heck? How did they do that? I mean, it looked like magic. Uh, yeah. So that was really influential watching those videos and then having all the Marin kids come to one place. And then after the video, usually the pros would be skating around like alling up a bench or a curb and all the kids would just be watching like, Holy crap. You know, these guys are just totally beyond us, you know? Right. So, and that was, and like I think somewhere around that time we're like, we should go to San Francisco. So we started taking that. We all, you know, whatever crew would form and we'd all get on the bus and take the bus to San Francisco and go to uh, Golden Gate Park was sort of the first, that was like the big spot we had heard about. And I, it probably was one, uh, one of these films they are like, yeah, you should, you know, everyone comes and skates on Sundays in right. Golden Gate Park because they right. closed off the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, and Bryce would bring the jump ramps and all those guys would show up and it was almost like a demo kind of vibe. Like people would yeah. be sitting there watching and people would come to skate. That's right. And then you'd have like the, Weird 70s roller skate dude, uh, you know, with the yeah. tiny shorts doing 360s or, you know, they always had some funny people showing up. Oh, it was, yeah. It was so much fun. Those films, getting people together in Marin, and then we'd all get on the bus. And it was really fun because people would, uh, I think the bus might have started in San Rafael or Fairfax, and it would come around. And then when it would get to like Kenfield, all the guys would stick their head out the window and be like, Ugh! you know, we get on the bus and we were like all in the back, like filled up the whole bus in the back. Yeah. And we just go to San Francisco and ride all day long, you know, How cool. Uh, you know, start in uh, maybe Embarcadero. We get off at the Embarcadero center, uh -huh. skate there, then take the bus and go all the way to Golden Gate Park. It's crazy how we knew how to use public transportation to get from one skate bot to the next. Like uh, for us, I grew up in the peninsula and I would go all the way to San Jose to skate those Montague banks. And I have no fucking idea how we got there because it was like probably three <laughs> bus transfers 
and there was no phones that told you how to do this. So like, yeah, it was probably word of mouth from other skaters. I'm guessing I can't really remember, but those kind of things are kind of, I don't know. I take a little pride in that. That's kind of cool stuff that we were doing that kids can't really relate to now. Yeah. I know meeting up with someone and, uh, trying to meet up somewhere where there was a, a, a pay phone somewhere, just in case something goes wrong, you can try to use, you can use the pay phone and call them. But the right. problem was always like, what if they left? Yeah. You know, you're like, I'm calling them now, but if they already left, so do I wait another hour? <laughs> like all that stuff, figuring yeah. out the bus rides. I mean, I remember going to Fort Point the first time and I was like, cause we were trying to go to the dish at Fort Point. And uh-huh. that was a hell of a bus ride too. I'm like, right. are we even, you know, I think we, after we met people in the park, they'd be like, Hey, we're going to go to Fort point. You want to ride the dish? And we're like, what's that? And I'm like, how long does it take to get there? And it took a while. I, I can't remember even how long that bus ride was 40 minutes or 50 minutes or something. Yeah. Um, all the way from golden gate park. Sketchy and neighborhood. Too. Sketchy neighborhood. They had a massive uh, half pipe there. Yeah. Uh, behind the houses. Mm-hmm. I remember trying to ride that thing because we didn't have a lot of, when I was starting out and even into like when I started getting into high school, there weren't a lot of big ramps. We made jump ramps, but there were not like half pipes around. Uh, right. So I remember going to the city and seeing some of these half pipes and trying to just, you know, go up and down on them. And I was like, man, this is crazy. Right. You know, just dropping in was like a big deal. So did Tommy and Jim and seeing that early video, was that like the first you saw jump ramps and that inspired you guys to make your own or how did you, how did jump ramps come into your life? You know, I think it was watching those early videos and the early, I think it was really that the film because, you know, nowadays stuff comes out so fast. Everyone puts something on YouTube, but Mm. I think the really cutting edge stuff were those films. And it was very unpolished. That's what I loved about it. That's kind of how I felt H Street was too. It yeah, wasn't raw. supposed to be super polished and clean and like, uh, like it was trying to pre- present you a special style or message or any of that stuff. They would just go film people do crazy stuff. And it was real film, you know. And when we would see it, we knew they, it was, it was uh, you know, we knew they had filmed that just in the last year or last few months or whatever. You know, early on, I was watching like the Powell videos, but then watching these films was even better. You just, and you'd see all these people you didn't know, like random people that weren't like big, huge pros or something. And mm. they'd do a, you know, anyone who did a good trick that was cool would be, make it into the film. So I think we saw those jump ramps and then I started building st- jump ramps too um, at home in the early days when we only took the bus. When we went to like Golden Gate Park, they'd have the jump ramps too. And they would have massive jump ramps that they would roll. I remember them rolling them through the streets, like really far away, you know, from whatever, from Haight Street, uh, wherever they had them stored. And they'd roll them through the park and everyone Uh would be waiting around. And here comes a massive jump ramp. You'd be like, oh, wow, look at that thing. Right. Uh, I think Bryce had this really big, huge, wide ramp, jump ramp that everyone loved. So I think we got inspired by those guys. Uh-huh. Uh, and then we started making ramps around our house. Um, and then at some point when we could drive, we would make a ramp and shove it in our trunk and we took it to San Francisco. Sick. And we started doing stuff where we, cause we wanted to jump up things. So instead of like, like it, uh, like a Barcadero, stage. instead of doing like that middle Island thing where you try to jump off all four steps or something, we uh-huh. would put the jump ramp up to it and jump up. Oh, to the, try to get up to the top of the island, <laughs> stuff like that. And were, like, uh, were you getting vibed at all for being at Embarcadero? Was there any hostility from like uh, locals from you guys coming from out of town or any of that? I don't remember really getting bad vibes. And maybe it's because we were doing crazy shit and they were like, who, who the hell are these guys? <laughs> I knew that people were like, what, who are these people? Yeah. Because we were just doing weird stuff, you know. We show up with a jump ramp and start jumping up the, the uh, the, the main the, that main drop off, uh-huh. and we start. Then we start putting it on top of the, you know. There's the Gons Channel, and there's there's the three steps afterwards. So once you make the Gons Channel, you have to go off those over those three steps. So 
So we put it on there. We started launching off that. And then there was the really long seven stairs, or I don't know how many stairs it was. We tried to launch over that whole thing. So, I mean, the early days when we went there, we didn't have launch ramps. We were just riding around doing stuff. I think we kept a pretty low profile. Um, and as we got better, we would sort of talk to people and, and meet people there. And I, I remember people being pretty nice. Huh. Um, it wasn't like a surfing thing where they were like, who's our home turf? You know, you guys shouldn't be skating here or something like that. Uh -huh. I remember be people being pretty nice. Um, yeah, it was hit or miss for me. I just remember vividly, and I always tell, uh, like, my girlfriend who doesn't know about skateboarding, like, the one thing that is the total faux pas is if you land a trick and then you stare at people, like, did you see me do that? Like, that, uh -huh. was, that was the worst thing you could ever do. Like, you don't look around like, hey, did you see what I did? And we learned that early on in skateboarding. And it kind of, like, carried over to, you know, regular life stuff. Like, it's not about, like, I mean, now Instagram is, like, me, 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 me. But, uh, yeah. but back then, it was definitely, like, you got to be cool, man. You got to do your shit and just keep doing you. People see it, but you don't need to, like, stare at them at the face. Like, did you see that? Like, that's yeah. a little much, so... Pat said that you were uh, that you created like some metal plates or something to put under your truck so that the uh, boards wouldn't break or something when you were flying off roofs and whatnot. Yeah, that's true. So some of my friends called me the mad scientist. And part <laughs> of it was I was really chintzy, like I didn't like to spend money. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and I didn't have a lot of money, really. I, I worked in, and, and worked in cafes and stuff, and I didn't like to uh, waste the stuff that I bought. So there was a period where I kept breaking boards. Like, I was breaking boards. Like, I, once I started doing uh, what I called ollie to grab, ollieing up and grabbing the board, um, and starting to try to go really high, I would do like an ollie and try to do a Japan air, which they, I don't know if anyone knows what that's called anymore, but we used to do something called a Japan air where you grab the front of your board. Yeah. You know, I'm regular it's, foot. So I like grab the front of the board. air and then you tweak it. And then tweak it way back, right? right? With my front foot and my front foot going back first. And when I pull the board down, a lot of times when I would do that, I would land with my foot on the tail. And I would just snap the boards. Um, and I really loved the feeling of doing that air, but I kept snapping the boards. And so I, uh, at metal shop in school, I, I made some uh, metal rods. And then I had these long rods and I drilled holes in them. And I put them under my truck like a base plate. And it was against the board. So that when the tail would come down, I would push those rods up and, oh. and at least extend where the board would have to break. Maybe it worked because it was where it was more concave farther up the board. Uh -huh. But you know, boards used to be like, they'd come around like the Lance Mountain style where it'd get narrow right by the truck. Uh -huh. And it was just easier to snap the board right there. So huh. by having these rods, it forced the wider part of the board would have to break. And it yeah. kind of saved my skateboards. No way. Uh, yeah, I always I wondered if shot or if uh, com companies, um, like if board brands maybe made uh jump ramps extra trendy because it was so great for business <laughs> <laughs> that's true there was a time there i think in high school where i was snapping boards like constantly it was sure. just, it was I mean, horrible yeah at least one or two board breaks every time there was a jump ramp session right like oh yeah no one's gonna break their board yeah you knew that sound i remember hearing crack yeah and, oh! scrape, and you're like oh there goes the board. oh you know that's it Hundred percent. Uh, so I remember there was a time once when I didn't have any money. I broke my board and I cut off the the place where it broke and I remounted the trucks and I was riding around a board without a tail. <laughs> I did then then I finally got a new board, but like uh that was that's so that's why I made those things because it was just super annoying uh to break your board. And then I also switched to doing uh doing instead of doing the japan air i would grab my other hand and do like whatever the tuck knee whatever they called it um because that when i came down with that i always have my back foot would stay on my truck and i stopped uh -huh. breaking boards i don't know who invented that trick but i remember seeing an ad of christian hisoi 
doing a tuck knee. And I don't think he didn't ollie to it. He just flew off the ramp and tweaked the board. Mm. And he just looked so cool. And I, so I started trying Style. to ollie and grab and try to do that. Right. Just so I could look like that all sideways and then land. So you were um, conscious of style, like you wanted not only to do the trick, but you wanted to do it like these guys that you saw in the mag that were doing it properly. Like, oh, yeah. I, I want to do it like Christian does it. For sure. I mean, I looked at that. And I'm like, well, I was, it was kind of like, how did he get in the air like that? And how is he going to land? Because you only see a picture. Right. Like, that was one thing that was cool about seeing Thrasher and Trans World. You get a picture you don't know what the heck they, you don't know what happened before or after, right? Like there's a great picture of Gons where he's completely tweaked his board, completely yeah. tweaked it back. Um, and I remember seeing that too and being like, how did he ever do that? Like, what is he actually doing? Uh -huh. um, so we would, and because in some ways we were ignorant, we didn't really see all the videos. Like we'd see some of these films and things. We would start just trying weird stuff and be like, well, what if I do this? Is, is, that, how, is that how they got in the air? And, sure. and is that what they did? But also is what felt really cool. Just getting completely, it's more twisted as you could in midair and still land. Just uh, felt so good, you know. Right. Uh, that was so part of the fun. In the video, you are flying over a ladder. How did that come about? Like, it's like, uh, were you you mentioned you would go to EMB and do stuff and go up things. And then did you start thinking like, now we need to like have something to like measure how high we're going over and like, well, so the ladder getting in there. Yeah. Where did the ladder come from? <laughs> well, I think it kind of, at least for, for the stuff that, that I was into, like, um, you know, when, when Joel and I started skating long ago and we would just find stairs to ride off, we just, for some reason, kept wanting to try to find bigger stuff to ride off, uh, bigger stairs to jump over. Then we started climbing up on roofs and trying to, you know, go higher and just drop off. This was before we really even knew how to ollie very well. I don't mm -hmm. know why. We just, it was something about trying to fly a little bit, flying over things. Did you have names um, for any of that stuff? Um, like I remember there was a name we had like locally for just like putting your trucks on the edge of like a wall and then just kind of coming off and falling. I forget what we called it, but did you guys have any names like that? Like you made your up your own names for those type of things? We, we did like, I mean, for like the, the ollieing and then grabbing your board, I called that ollie to grab. I mean, right. once the ollie came around, it totally transformed like I like the forward ollie. <laughs> yeah, and the forward ollie. That's right. Yeah. Um, we, we had seen people doing these 180 things. Um, I mean, it would be really neat to know, like, if, like, the real history of who did the first forward ollie or where did it come from. I guess it was probably Rodney Mullen. That's, yeah, he's credited. I figure it must sure. have been him. Cause, and here's a guy who was totally isolated creating all this stuff by himself, you know, I mean, Rodney Mullen was an amazing. So we, we started, I remember we, so Joel and I would jump off lots of stuff. And then when we learning, when we were learning forward ollies, like we figured out we should sit in a crack in the sidewalk and like keep trying and trying to get the board to go up. Yeah. Um, and we really didn't know how to do it. We only watched that movie, um, at, at, uh, college of Marin. And I think we were like, we were blown away. I still didn't quite know what was going on. Um, so it took a while to put together, but once we could figure out how to ollie, that was everything. That was like, now I can jump up stuff. Now I can grind stuff. And then we used to do the jump ramp thing where you'd ride and grab your board, like, and, and launch off it. Yeah. Which I think all came from vert, right? Like an early uh, grab. Yeah. Like all the, um, all the street contests had all the vert skaters out there like riding and they'd even have a piece of, I remember these street ramps that had a coping at the end, like the same thing we were trying to do over the steps. They'd pop off the coping and grab in the air. Um, and that was the way, or they would hold on, you know, some people would hold on the whole way up the ramp. Otherwise the like the vert guys would knew how to hit the coping and then grab yeah. because that's what you did on vert. But, once we learned how to ollie, it was like, I was like, wow, now you can go really high, you know, as far as you can suck your feet up. 
Mm. And then I wanted to be able to grab it. So I was like, you could tweak it and do things. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we did all this stuff at home for a while. And then we would be like, yeah, let's go on Sunday to Golden Gate Park. And I remember first starting to do ollies at Golden Gate Park off a ramp watching Tommy Guerrero. Mm. And um, I mean, I was still pretty young. So watching Tommy and Bryce and all those guys definitely influenced us. And uh, uh, I started to try to learn how to ollie as high as he could and just get way up there. And that was kind of fun. That was, you know, you mentioned this thing about you do a trick and then you'd look to see if anyone sees you. Yeah. I think in the early days, we never, we didn't really do that. It was more like, did I make it? Did I kill myself? (laughs) Um, I think what kind of changed that was when we go to Golden Gate Park, I remember all the people sitting on the, on the, uh, on this bridge and on the grass and they would cheer when people went off the ramp. Mm. And so I do remember going there and then learning how to ollie off the ramp. And I remember doing a huge ollie off that ramp and having all these people cheer. And I was like, Whoa, like, Wow. Cause I didn't know how, I didn't really know how high I was going. We're with, you know, Tommy Guerrero goes off the ramp. It was like, who's going to go after Tommy? Fuck. Right. That was always like Tommy would go and Ollie and just float dude uh, so far, you know? And I was like, God, and then no the one wanted to go. And just like everything. Perfect. So I think one time I went after him and did a big Ollie <laughs> and everyone still cheered. So I was like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> That was really fun. And now, another first impression with Timothy Donald McKenney. Wow. These are classic memories of my childhood in skateboarding. Sitting there and on the couch, probably at Crouch's house, watching Smokey Down Ray Simmons Wild Barbecue Man. And, uh, that stale fish, that goddamn stale fish over the ladder, just tall, lanky, staley over a ladder that nobody's even gonna early grab over back then. You know what I mean? Just some dope ass flyboy shit. Top of that, Pettit, was it Jeff Pettit with his uh, wild G turns. And uh, it's just classic times, guys. Uh, I'm doing this just in case Duffy can't be found. I love you guys. Stay up. Let's get into the Age Street stuff. So once you met Ron and, and you were saying Ron called you, you're, you're on the phone, your mom's yelling at you about like the condition you're in and Ron's offering you boards. Um, yeah. How does that go? Do you get a first box in, in the mail or, or do you go meet up with them? Or like how does it like kind of the initial stages of all that go? So the uh – What was cool about these, the way they would sort of sponsor people at that time was, you know, you'd meet somebody, a pro or something, they'd watch you skate, they'd say, you know, it was almost like a uh, a mentorship thing. And Mm. so Ron would meet me somewhere and give me stuff. Like here's some, so, so when I first met him, I think I met him in San Francisco. He might, I don't even know if he would remember, but I think I might've met him in San Francisco somewhere at like the um, Barcadero or something. But I remember him saying, why don't you just come to Oakland? So when I rode with him in Oakland, we rode all day and, and we did a lot of crazy stuff um, and skated all over the place. So then when I got home and he was like, hey, I want to sponsor you, it was more like, come back to Oakland, let's skate. And I would go to his house and then he'd be like, here's a board, here's a shirt. And, uh, and I was like, wow, this is, this is, this is super cool. Ah. Uh, So it was more of a mentor thing. And I remember Joel was sponsored by, he got sponsored by Tommy Guerrero and, um, and Joel would go over to Tommy Guerrero's house and get boards and stuff like that. We were always like, Whoa, nice, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, so I skated for Ron for a while and then there was this skate camp in Santa Clara. Yeah. I think it was Santa Clara. Um, and, uh, and he said, you know, uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be um, doing this skate camp and being a counselor there and stuff. You should come and go skate it. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I went down there, that's when I met uh, Ternaski. Um, and, and, to- and Tony Magnuson was, was there too. Okay. Um, 
And then I did the, the in the H Street video, the, the first trick I do, I think, is I grind that railing. Got to uh, I ollie and grind down this 50-50, this railing. I think I did that before and rail slid that railing earlier in the week or something. And that was when I think Ternaski was like, you're on the H Street team now. And then they started sending me actual boxes of stuff. Ah. I was like, holy crap. You know, I couldn't <laughs> believe it. Um, were you they aware? They filmed all that stuff there too. Like, I didn't know. They were like, can we film you too? We're going to make a video. And I was like, sure. Uh huh. Whatever. And I met Brian Lottie and all these other people that were there. Um, I mean, that all opened up after that skate camp thing. Um, was Hensley there? So, and I, I think all of the guys, the H Street guys had come, the, the camp was all summer. So they would come for like three weeks uh, and then go home. So he did, I think he did, he was definitely there because there are shots of him doing stuff there. I'm trying to remember if I, I think I met him there too. We were only there for like a week or two or something. Mm. Um, and, uh, I don't even remember that we signed up for the camp. I think we just, <laughs> <laughs> I think we just showed up and okay. I think Jeff, Jeff's sister or someone had, uh, I think maybe Jeff's sister was going to school down there or something and huh. we just crashed at somebody's place and then just barged in and started skating there. So we were kind of invited, but we weren't really, we didn't like enroll in the skate camp. Um, did Jeff get connected kind of through you or was he already connected or? Well, I think what happened was is when we went to the skate camp together, uh, Ternaski was there watching us all skate and he put me on the team and then he saw Jeff do all this crazy stuff. And then he put Jeff on the team too. So he said, you guys are both on the team ah. and he filmed us. So that's why a lot of that there's stuff from skate camp in the, H street video because that was, those were, that was like the first thing we ever got filmed doing. Right. Um, and then later, uh, Dave came, uh, I'm trying to remember his last name, the guy, Dave, who made the, the H street video, they all traveled to Marin and then, um, filmed us do stuff. And, uh, and are you getting back to the ladder? That was what you asked me about a long <laughs> time ago. Yeah. Um, we would, whenever we were doing jump ramp stuff, we always started jumping over things just to see how high we could go. And I, 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 uh, I can send you that photo that Gabe Morford took of uh, me jumping over two ramps stacked up. Mm, I'd like to um, see that. We would always just start stacking stuff up to see how high we could go. Almost like, uh, you know, like, um, little, like the pole vaulter guys that go over the bar. Yeah. We always kept, we, we would just start piling stuff up. I don't know. We just wanted to see if we could make it over stuff. Right. Um, so I think with the ladder, I actually think Dave went into Jeff's garage and found the ladder because we were going pretty high, but we were like, how high are we going? And, uh, okay. you know, if you have to go over something, it forces you to go even higher. Yeah, exactly. So I think Dave pulled that thing out of Jeff's garage and stuck it in front of – that was at Jeff's house with his ramp, and he put that thing up. It was like, do you guys think you can jump over this? Oh, so you had never done it before. It was – that was the first time you had done it, and it was for the video. Yeah, yeah. We had never done it before. Uh, we would cool. always skate Jeff's ramp and, uh, you know, do tricks and stuff. But I think it was Dave who actually pulled it out of the garage and said, can you do this? And uh, so then we started trying to see if we could make it over it. Um, was Ternans Ternaski, would he come up and film with you guys or was it more Dave? It was just Dave. Oh, okay. Dave would travel around to uh, different people's locations and film. Is that and, Dave's uh, uh, Schl Schloschbach? Schloschbach, yeah. That's okay. his last name. Yeah, yeah. okay. He was super nice guy. Right. So yeah, like, and th what's funny is the the last shot, I think, where uh, I jump over the ladder and it looks like it's from far away. I didn't know Dave was filming me. They had left. We were done. I think I did the stale fish over it, and uh, Jeff had ollied over it a couple times, uh -huh. and then those guys left and they were going back to the house. And I was like, I think I'm just gonna. I want to try to see if I can really do a tuck knee over this thing. Because I kept trying and wasn't making it, but I made the stalefish. So I didn't even know they were filming me. And then I did that one. 
and I landed and came down and, uh, and I was like, Oh, he's like, yeah, I just got that. I saw that he was in the driveway filming it. And I was like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. So I think it was, I was probably, uh, more in the zone when I wasn't on the camera, when I was just going for it. You know, I didn't even, I had no idea they were filming anymore. Uh -huh. I just wanted to make it. And did any of your friends have video cameras back then, or would you only be able to film when those guys were uh, around to film you? The guy that was in the picture, Mark Henderson, he had a video camera. Oh. Um, uh, well, I should say, Gabe Morford always had a camera. Yeah. So he was taking pictures uh, but before I ever knew him. Uh, I'm sure this has all been written up somewhere. Cause he's a big guy. He's, I mean, he was... In, in high school, he started getting into photography and doing stuff in the high school dark room. Mm -hmm. So he always had his camera. So that was actually really cool. Like the photo I'm going to send you, that was one of the shots. He, we were at some demo, probably a Marine Surf Sports demo, uh, you know, showing off for kids and stuff. That, that one, there's kids all over the place. Um, uh -huh. And he took that shot, but he was filming. He was, so he was taking pictures all the time. Oh, wow. And Mark Henderson had a video camera, so he would film us sometimes, but we didn't really film that much stuff with video cameras, surprisingly. Um, mm. We always had, you know, Gabe would show us his photos. He would take really cool photos. It was almost like he was really into what still shots looked like. And from us watching magazines, we were always really into watching what the stills would look like. Like, mm. what did you capture in the middle of a trick and how did it look? more so than videoing everything. Um, right. I mean, I wish uh, we've, we, uh, a long time ago, we pestered Mark, do you still have these old, you know, VHS tab tapes yeah. uh, of you, the stuff that you filmed? Like, it would be so cool if we could see that stuff. I don't know. Um, so it probably all got uh, videoed over later. Or who knows what <laughs> happened to it? <laughs> yeah, thrown out with the baseball cards. <laughs> I mean, we were lucky we had Gabe around taking pictures constantly, kind of in the same vein as those uh, movies that would show at College of Marin. Gabe started doing these uh, photo things. I think he might have started filming stuff. I'm trying to remember because in Fairfax, he, would, he started putting out these big – I remember him mostly being photo shoots. He'd have the big thing big with the – Slideshows? Slideshows, yeah, yeah. With the big carousel. Slide projector, yep. He started getting really into doing um, – all the slides or whatever those things are called. I can't even remember now. Isn't that sad? Yeah, it's a slide projector with the carousel wheel, basically. Yeah, and all those slides. So we would have a, a big night where everyone would come and he would show all these video, all these uh, pictures. And were they from, mostly of the locals? Usually, yeah, whoever Gabe was skating with. Uh-huh. You know, and he started, of course, once we started going to uh, like San Francisco and the park he was started to take photos of all those pros and stuff too. It was really cool to go to these events where we would get to see all these different uh, shots that he had taken. Nah. It was super fun. And yeah. that was, again, another one of those things where we'd all come, we'd get super jazzed, we'd watch all videos and um, these slideshows, and then we'd go and skate that night, like afterwards out at the school and try to do crazy stuff because everyone would get pumped up. Hmm. Super fun. Was there like something or like a period of time where you were living out of your car where you like took the front seat out and made a refrigerator or something like that? <laughs> um, no, I did buy an, uh, a really old car for like 200 bucks. It was a Plymouth Valiant. Uh -huh. And uh, I was, I had a, I took the back seat out for a while and I had planned to put a bed in the back. Uh. So I was going to put a bed in the back, but then I was going to have to saw off these uh, crossbars in the back. And I was worried that I might uh, like weaken the car or screw it up somehow. So uh. I ended up not doing that, but I did put a TV set. I had a little, uh, like a little tiny battery powered TV, or actually I think I hooked it to the car. So I, I had a little tiny one of these remote TVs that was you could plug in the wall, mm -hmm. and I and you could plug it into a like a uh, cigarette lighter. So 
So I made a little console and put a TV in there and I hooked it up to the spe speakers. So sometimes I'd be watching TV in my car, which was pretty funny. That was all in high school. But right. I think I probably told people I was going to put a waterbed back there. <laughs> that would be. <laughs> yes. Um, I thought if I got in an accident and a giant water, like I freaked and a giant waterbed <laughs> landed on me, it probably wouldn't be good. So I think I saved my life not doing that. Could you talk a little bit? Do you remember meeting Duffy for the first time? Oh, Yeah. The thing we remembered about Duffy was the, uh, he had taken a, uh, a railing, like a balance beam thing from school, from one of the local schools. I think it was, or maybe it was always out there at, at the school near his house. Um, and I remember hearing that this guy is skating this railing. You, you should come check it out. So uh, we went over to his house and went, and went to this school and he had this railing with the little bars on it. And I remember like he was doing all kinds of cool grinds and rail slides on the bar. And I was like, wow, this kid's going to be really, really good. Cause like, I mean, he trained himself on that little bar to do everything on it. So by the time he got, you know, up to the point where he could ollie up to railings and stuff, he was completely comfortable. You know what I mean? Uh, like right. he was so good on railings cause he had, loved this bar and rode it every day, you know? Uh -huh. So I remember seeing him do that. And I remember also going, there was a mini ramp around there somewhere. Um, and I remember skating that mini ramp. I remember he would just go for tricks and slam really hard and just keep going and going. Like he, he, he wouldn't stop. And I'm like, this guy is going to be super good. <laughs> um, and when Duffy came out for the first time in that plan B video, everyone was blown the fuck away. Like the Terminator, like who the fuck? I mean, <laughs> you, you didn't really know anything about this guy. And then he had one of the greatest video parts of all time. Yeah. I was just wondering from your perspective, since you grew up with him and, and saw, you knew what was coming kind of, were you there on a lot of that filming and stuff? Or? I, no, I wasn't there for that filming. Joel did that railing. He board slid that railing like years before. So who knows, Pad may have looked at that railing for years going, man, I'm going to attack that thing. Uh, it'd be cool to ask Pat, but he probably, he's like, someday I'm going to destroy that thing. And I do remember hearing this because he told me that when he did film that part, he was getting so damn good, but no one even knew who he was or he just couldn't break in. So he said, fuck this, I'm going to make my own video. I'm going to send it to Chernasky. And I remember like, go for it, dude, you should. And I remember he went to film that railing and it started raining and he was like, ah, oh, shit. And he just did the, he did that damn thing anyway in the rain, dude. That's, that's where I was like, holy shit. Oh yeah. To do a backside lip slide on a rail that long in at that time and in the rain <laughs> and not slide out and slam onto your head. Yeah. I think it just, I got chills. I was like, holy crap, dude. Like, boy, you wanted this bad. Like, you were, like, really going for it. I mean, he just went beyond, right? He's like, I want to get I want to get this stuff going. And, and uh, oh, yeah. you know, he was on a local team. He was on the surf sports team and stuff. But, you know, he deserved to be on a much bigger team. He deserved it, the big deal, you know? And, what do you uh, think, like, drove him? Like, how – how did he come from, you know, your neck of the woods and go ballistic like that? Like, who was pushing him? Was he just pushing himself? Was he always well, a lunatic since he was a little kid? I think, uh, I mean, he gives us, he gives Joel and I and Jeff and all these guys credit because he watched us do stuff because he was uh -huh. a lot younger than us. Right. But... But truly, he, he just took it far beyond. I mean, he did all those different tricks on his rail – and then he just, I don't know what made him go like, sure, I'm just going to do it on this massive railing. I, even I should say, even on like uh, the mini ramp, he was really good on the mini ramp too. Oh, I yeah. think he just had a ton of natural ability. I think he just loved how it feels. He, I mean, when he does it, he, he's just flowing, you know? It's right. really effortless watching him do that stuff. He's just like, he's embodying the whole thing. Absolutely. I so, love Pat. Hopefully he's listening and he's doing okay. Big love to Duffy. Yeah, um, definitely, Pat. 
I told Pat he's done way more for skating than 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 I ever did, and he's <laughs> he put this thing together. I'm like. Dude, you went beyond, man. You took it to another level where it was like too scary to continue. <laughs> yeah, think- he's all the great inspiration. Like anybody that's doing rails now is like Pat Duffy. Yeah, straight up. And I don't know if if he told you, but um, he was there when I snapped my knee, which kind of ended my skate career. Right. Um, we had gone up to this uh, ramp up in Novato, I don't even remember whose ramp it was. It was a mini ramp and it had a bunch of, um, it was the black point ramp, right? It probably was. It had like all kinds of holes in the top deck. It was like kind of thrashed. Yeah. It was in hocus pocus, I think. Right. So yeah, I don't remember if that video was, I don't remember if that ramp was in a video. I can't remember. Maybe Pat remembers, but, uh, Mm -hmm. I just remember it was kind of thrashed. Like the, the, the top deck had gotten thrashed from people doing stuff on it. And right. I had gone up to do a tail slide and I did a tail slide and then stuck in one of the holes. And when I went down my legs, my uh, right leg stayed at the top and my board went in and it just went <clears throat> tweaked my knee and uh, it just snapped. Like I heard it pop. Yeah. And, uh, and I think actually the reason I destroyed my knee was because, uh, I, this was, I was living in Santa Barbara at the time and I had come home. I was going to Santa Barbara city college and living down there and I had come home for Christmas break. And just before I left for Christmas break, I was riding near the Powell. There was the Powell factory down there. Yeah. yeah. And there was, they, they were redoing the, the, uh, all the drainage in that area. And they had all these giant, um, blue pipes out uh, that they were going to put in the ground. They were huge. They were like 15 inches or something. So mm. I was like rail sliding those things mm. and it was a little wet and I slipped off one and kind of tweaked my knee. And I remember it hurt really bad. Like I landed and tweaked it and it hurt really bad. And then it, the pain went away and I thought, Oh, okay. You know, I'm okay. And then I went up, then I went back to uh, Northern California and then I went to skate that ramp. So I think I actually tore it. Uh huh, and, then, and you, then then I just did it again, and it just completely snapped on me. And right. uh, and I remember stepping on the on the bottom of the ramp, and my and it felt my knee go sideways. Fuck. And I was like, "Oh man!" So I drove Pat. Pat and I were in my truck. I drove him back to my house, and I'm like, "Dude, can I not drop you off at home? Because I'm just I'm toast, man." And I drove with a stick. I took a stick out of the. He said like you I used ripped. a ski pole for cruise control or something like that. Like maybe it was a ski. I remember grabbing a stick because I found a stick, and then yeah, I stuck the stick in the on the accelerator because it was my right leg, and I just couldn't handle the pressure on it. Uh huh. Um, and then I remember I had a brand new. I think I had a brand new Matt Hensley board. It could have been a. Uh, it was like brand new, new everything. I think it was a king size. And I said, "Here, Pat." take my board, dude. I think I'm going to be out for a while. I don't know if he remembers that, but I remember being like, dude, just take my board. No, he, and totally he was shocked. He was that. like, what the hell? Yeah. He <laughs> mentioned that he, he told me that story. He's like, dude, he's the best dude ever. Like he just fucking fucked his knee up. He heard it pop. He's, he said, he said that you used a ski pole, but it could have been a stick or whatever. Uh, for cruise control on the drive home. And then he's like, then he, then he gave me his board. <laughs> yeah. But he said that was, you I, were the, you actually gave him his first free skateboard ever earlier. Um, when he was like skating his flat bar or something, he said he did like a feeble grime varial out and you're like, Hey, that gets you a free board or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> I probably did. They, the H street was very kind. They sent me way too much stuff. Really? I mean, like I said, I was used to destroying my boards, you know, riding them for a super long time and totally destroying them. I had, one of my favorite boards was the, uh, the Tony Magnuson board with the ugly dude on the bottom who was all like, mm. uh, who was like showed his in, internal, like it was all gooey, yeah. funky stuff. I, I don't, I, the, uh, it was the hell concave. That was uh-huh. the hell concave board. Hell concave, yeah. hell concave. Uh, so, 
I remember being at Marin Surf Sports and uh, doing ollies like a foot high with no trucks on. Uh, in there, when, when that board came out, I, I found it and they, they said, hey, this board came out and I was doing ollies because the concave was so huge, I could just pop it up. And I was like, man, this board's awesome. So I bought that board, it was like my favorite board uh, forever and, and I had destroyed the nose so bad that at one point I, uh, I took the nose off of one of my old boards and, and cut it off and then, uh, cause I had ground it all the way down to the truck. So I took a second, second board and another piece of board as the base plate and bolted it all together so I could still have a nose. Oh, wow. So that, that is the, that's how far I would destroy my boards. And then when they, they started sending me decks, I had too many decks because <laughs> I was used to riding them until they were completely demolished. You know, uh -huh. I was like, it was weird. And then people are like, dude, what are you doing? You're supposed to sell that stuff, make uh, some money or, you know, what was a typical box? Like, like what would come in your, t like your average box that they would send you. So they'd send me a box that was like, you know, uh, seven by 14, you know, by whatever. And uh -huh. they would put like five boards in there, three, four pairs of wheels, bunch of t-shirts. Um, and so when I got that stuff, I was like, whoa. And there'd be trucks in there. I had <laughs> way Christmas. more stuff than I needed. And people were like, dude, you're supposed to sell that stuff. Uh. <laughs> you know, and then I guess eventually when you're pro, you, you make, you know, you make money when your board sells. You get a, a portion of whatever uh, amount, number of boards you sold. Mm. Uh, so, so I gave stuff away. I, I had way more stickers, like huge wads of stickers. And I would always give those out to everybody. Uh, Did you save any stuff from back so, then? And I do. I should have grabbed, uh, I have like an old, I still have two of the hell concave boards because oh, I right. held on to those. Uh -huh. I have an old Schultes board um, that's just sitting around. Um, I, I actually talked to Tony Magnuson because <clears throat> I had recently because I was looking for, I mean, I have one board here. I was looking for a, a king size Hensley again. So I bought this online. Oh. Old black label. I love the king size Hensley. It's like my favorite board. Uh huh. Uh, so I emailed him and he was, and he emailed me back and he was like, hey, you know, it's good to hear from you and what's happening and stuff. Me. So, um, so we talked for like two hours and I told him, you know, we talked for a long, long time about life and different things and Ternaski and yeah. what had happened with the company and all that stuff. Oh. Um, I mean, I was, it was really sad that Ternaski died. I remember Pat telling me that Ternaski died and now, you know, I was like, what, you know, I heard it through the grapevine somehow from, mm -hmm. from through him. And, uh, it was really sad, you know, as he was really pushing everything, but how did he pass? He got in a car accident with his uh -huh. girlfriend. I, I don't think she survived either. Oh, wow. I think that's what happened. Yeah. It was totally, un, you know, it was out of the blue, right? Mm. He was driving somewhere and there was a, a car accident and, uh, and that was it. Because I was sort of out of the scene by that point. I uh -huh. had, after I snapped my knee, I, I was out for like six months. Did you have surgery? Uh, yeah, I had complete uh, ACL reconstruction. Uh -huh. And at that time, they, um, you know, they immobilized you for a long, long time, like six months. Uh, now they don't do that. Now they, they, like, as soon as you get, so I had a um, reconstruction where, where they, I think that, I don't know what the term is for it, but they take your patella tendon, they take your kneecap, and they take a chunk of bone off your kneecap and a chunk of bone below your patella where it connects to your leg bone and they, and they slice the middle out and pull it out and they drill a hole and send it through where the, the ACL was. And then they screw it in with titanium screws. And then the little two little pieces of bone grow back into your, your leg bone. Um, and at that time when they, I mean, I guess it may have been relatively new. They, they really immobilized you for months. And now they don't do that. They get you going on your knee, your recovery right away. Um, 
So, but I, I remember being out for like six months, you know, I, uh, went back to school and was, had this massive brace that kept my legs straight. Um, so kind of by the time I got back, I mean, H street was still selling me, sending me stuff all the time. And, uh, I just, uh, I, I kind of feel bad because I didn't really call them and say, you, you know, I told them, I called them and said, I got, you know, I got injured. I talked to Ternaski. I said, I, you know, I broke my ACL. I'm getting surgery mm-hmm. and all that stuff. And Ternaski just kept saying, well, get, you know, get back in there, get back in there, you know, heal up. And they kept sending me boards. And I was like, you guys don't send me anything anymore. You know, I'm not riding. Uh-huh. And he was just trying to get me motivated. Uh, okay. By the time I came back after six months and I was feeble and I was trying to learn how to skate again, I just felt like I was out of it, you know, like everything was progressing so fast at so that time. Fast. Yeah. You know? I was like, I'm, I was kind of out of it for a year. Yeah. I mean, part of me regrets that I didn't just say, you know, whatever, let's just, you know, get back into it. I mean, I did skate again and I went to the Powell factory. Uh-huh. I remember skating with my brace on, but I just didn't feel the same, especially trying to, ollie and grab with a big fat brace on my right leg Heck, <laughs> just yeah. bummed you know well, was that after the video had come out though yeah so i mean that was uh shackle not came out then hocus pocus came out by but when i was by the time i was in hocus pocus i was in santa barbara oh. and um so i really and and dave came and filmed us but i really didn't put as much uh I didn't put as much footage in on that video. Um, he wasn't there for very long. Mm. Um, and I had debated when I, before I moved to Santa Barbara, I debated maybe I should go to San Diego and go hang out with Hensley and all those guys. Sometimes mm-hmm. I feel like that would have been, uh, if I had done that, maybe I would have been, uh, you know, I would have been way more into the scene. I probably would have turned to pro and all that stuff. I would have uh-huh. gotten sucked into it all. But right. My friends from high school were going to Santa Barbara. Joel went to, to Santa Barbara. My friend Mike went to Santa Barbara. And I kind of felt like I was a little worried if I go down to San Diego, I'll probably just kill myself try <laughs> jumping off all this stuff. I was, right. I was like, I don't know. Um, so I just went down to uh, – plus, I didn't do any schoolwork in high school. I was, had terrible grades, and huh. I was like, what, what should I do? Um, so I, I, uh, went, I went down to visit Santa Barbara where my friends were. Joel, Joel and my, my friend Mike already went to Santa Barbara after high school. And I stayed home and skated and, um, and uh, went to uh, auto school. Because I thought, you know, if I don't do any, if I don't know what I'm going to do, I can always fall back on uh, working on cars. Because I bought that $200 car. I bought another car for like uh-huh. 500 bucks and fixed it up and sold it. So I thought I'll just be a car mechanic. So I was going to auto school and stuff. And I went down to Santa Barbara and visited them. And I was blown away. Cause I, if I had known college was a big fat party, <laughs> maybe I would have been like, Hey, Especially maybe I should I do some Vista. schoolwork and go to college. <laughs> <Fuck>. <laughs> Those guys, they just partied like crazy and skated around and were, <laughs> Just having so much, and Santa Barbara is such a cool place. Yeah. So I went down mecca. there and I was like, "Oh my god, I'm not missing out anymore." So, so then I went. So the next year, in in '89, I moved down to Santa Barbara and uh, skated around um, there. And then the Hocus Pocus guys they filmed some of that stuff. And then it was during that year that I came home for Christmas break. So it must have been Christmas of of 89 or something. And um, that's when you s- snapped your knee. And that's when I snapped my knee. Yeah. Did, did you so. realize when you were, especially in the first video, did you realize what you were a part of at that time? Like how impactful that group of people and what you guys were putting together was, did you realize it, how special it was or did it just kind of seem like, mm, this is just what's going on? No, I was totally oblivious. I was only happy that, uh, I mean, I, Ron Allen was a super cool guy. He was great. Um, it, it all happened so fast too. Like, I mean, uh-huh. what was great is what I did like was that, we, you know, we were skating Golden Gate Park and 
we were skating with the pros. I remember doing big ollies in the park and riding with the pros and meeting Tommy. Tommy and those guys once came over to uh, Marin Surf Sports competition. I think Tommy was interested. Well, he told me he was interested in sponsoring me. He came to this competition, and I remember that I completely sucked. <laughs> I was horrible. I couldn't <laughs> land any tricks. I was terrible. Uh, Did you know he like, was there? To <laughs> oh, he was there to evaluate me. Uh, and you knew it? Yeah. Uh, so I knew it. Bebo was there. They were all there. And I was like, because they had seen me do great stuff in the park. I think I remember them saying, you got to, you know, you should be able to do, you got to be able to do well in a competition, uh, you know? And I was like, that was totally not my thing, man. I, I being, being told to do a trick on the spot was just not my thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So during that competition, I remember like I was trying to do, cause I had learned how to do kick flips on a big fat board. Uh, I don't think I, I'd never seen anyone else do it. Um, and I had met, been friends with Ray Meyer, who is a freestyler that lived in yeah, San Francisco. Yeah, I know Ray. And I started hanging out with Ray a lot. He's a super nice guy. I love super, Ray. Yeah. And he took me to Visalia Skate Camp, and I got to meet uh, Rodney Mullen. So I was like, whoa. And so wow. I started trying to do kickflips on my big board when I was with Rodney Mullen and uh -huh. was showing him, hey, because I think – I think Ray Meyer was like, hey, you should show Rodney that you can do this because I saw him do it. And Rodney Mullen was like, hey, cool kid. You know, he was totally beyond. He was like a god. You know, yeah. I was like, but anyway, so I, when I went to the park one time, I did, a, I did kick flips in the park. And, and so Tommy was like, hey, wow, this is cool. And I started doing kick flips off the little jump ramp. So then he was like, wow, maybe I'll sponsor you. Let's see how you do in this competition. And he came mm. and uh, Thibaut came and I was trying kickflip over and over and not making it. And then uh, there was a trick called a hazard. I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. Tommy used to do it. He'd yeah. like put his hand down and flip his board up. Right. I remember I was so like bummed out that I was, I was not making anything. I couldn't ollie off a ramp. I tried to do an, a hazard and I was so like bummed. I didn't even put my hand down. I just sort of picked up my board and was like flapped it around and put it down. And I was like, totally sucked and <laughs> never got sponsored. And I was like, so bummed. Uh, um, I was like, man, I just wasn't into the whole competition thing at all. I was yeah, like, a lot of people aren't. Yeah. It just didn't work for me. But, mm. uh, so when, uh, when a street was like, let's film you, just do whatever you're doing like at a spot, I would, that was, I was like, wow, this is really cool. Like, well, it's fun. To, it's, I, we were way more into going to places and trying tricks. And I was also known for being, you know, people would get pissed at me and be like, let's go if we're at a spot. Cause I would try to do a trick like a thousand times. Uh. And, and if I wasn't making it, I'd be like, just let me do one more time. Let me just try one more time. And they'd be like, let's go. We got to go. Like, let's get out of here. You know, I would obsess over trying to make some trick. And uh, that's just, th th you know, that's not, that doesn't, like competition, I mean, I was never a good test taker either at the, at, in co high school and stuff. Uh, and that was the same thing. You have to learn how to dial the test and like figure out how do you get every answer right. It's not about whether you know the material necessarily is how well are you at doing the test and figuring out strategy. And I think it was the same for competitions. Like even later when I was on the H street team and we go to a competition, I would watch the people and they would go and pick every trick they were going to do and dial it. Like I'm going to do this rail slide and then I'm going to do this move maneuver and then this thing. And they would practice their routine. And I remember Chernavsky trying to teach me how to like set up a routine and Instead, I just wanted to jump off some crazy thing or can I fly over this thing? Uh -huh. And so I typically just did horrible on all these. I would never land anything. <laughs> yeah. And then there's resentment too. You're a kid. You're, you're skateboarding because you kind of have like punk rock values. Like you're not conforming to this stuff. And then you have these team managers that are telling you how to do it. You, you look at them like a parent figure where you're like, whatever you just told me, I'm doing the opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, 
you know, I, 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 I knew Chernowski was help trying to help me. Yeah. And like, I could tell that I could tell that he saw the global picture of all this stuff. And as you were asking before, I did not see the global picture of the company and how well it does and all the cool mm. stuff in the video. That was what he was, you know, he was really building this brand. He was really pushing this brand and he right. knew what he was doing. He knew how to market and to push the brand and get everyone into it. Um, Where do you think that came from? I think he was just, I think he was a natural businessman. Huh. He could just see where everything could go. So he really helped, uh, you know, blow up 8th Street. He knew the videos were a big deal and all the kids liked all the videos. He mm -hmm. knew that doing well in competitions was important because, you know, magazines are taking pictures of everyone. They're posting results. I mean, and now, you know, looking back, I think part of that is another reason why after I you know, broke my knee, um, I bailed out because the, the summer before I broke my knee, before I went to Santa Barbara, I went on tour with 8th Street and we went across the country. So I think we started in Dayton, Ohio. There was a guy with a shop there that sponsored this tour. And then we went all over the Midwest and it, it was with Hensley and Ron Allen. Like it was one of the funnest times. It was, it was so cool. Uh -huh. Um, but during that tour there, I had some major things where one time I, I, I hurt my foot. Like I landed on the side of my board doing a kick flip thing. And I landed a number of times in the exact same spot. And I had this big black, like uh bruise on the bottom of my foot uh -huh. and it was, it was killing me, you know, yeah. but we would be like, you'd skate one place and then you'd have a day break while you drive in your van to the next spot and then you'd skate again yeah and i remember being like man like my foot's killing me and it's getting worse like i have no time to recover mm. uh so that thing that was one thing like you know if you're pro you got to suck it up you know and just keep skating uh so that was one thing that i was like wow man this is this is you know it's a bit of a job it's it's work you know you got to go for it you, you you're, you know people are counting on you you know you can't just say, forget it. I'm not going to skate today. And then, uh, who would there were other the, times. Oh okay, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was wondering who would be the guy, um, on those trips that would be kind of like, was there a team manager or was there like a filmer that was kind of like in chart, you know, has the card and taking care of like everything driving or whatever. Yeah. Chernaski. Chernaski was driving the van around. Oh, he was. The uh, and guy. we had any, we had another guy, but I don't remember his name. There was another guy that, uh, and Dave Andrecht, I can't remember if Dave Andrecht was on that. Dave Andrecht was another guy. I remember when oh, I met hey. Dave Andrecht, I was like, Whoa, it's Dave Andrecht. <laughs> he was also <laughs> part of that crew. Whoa, uh, that's heavy. Yeah. He was, huh. he was cool, man. To, to meet him was really neat. Uh, but they were all great. You know, they were really trying to drive us around and they take us to all these demos and, and encourage us to do stuff. But there were times, there were a couple demos. Uh, there was a demo I did with Sean Sheffy. I met, got to meet Sean Sheffy. He was on that tour. And he was, he was awesome. That guy was so good. And sometimes we get into these things where we were doing, uh, we would be competing all in over some channel. They'd take two ramps and move them farther and farther and farther away. Oh, right. And I remember, you know, I was, uh, one of my big regrets is I didn't uh, really learn to skate vert. Like I, I would think I would have loved vert if I got super into vert. So yeah. I was always a little sketch landing on a transition. I always right. worried about hanging up or hitting it and flying out. Uh -huh. And I remember competing with like Sean and I were moving these ramps farther and farther apart. And I was just freaking out. I was like, I don't know if I can land this transition. So I would try to clear the whole ramp. Oh, but once shit. he started making it really, really far, uh -huh. I started to break, man. Sheffy <laughs> cracked me. I couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't land. I was too freaked out. That's and he amazing. and he kept making it. And I'm like, damn, this guy's good. You You're know? dealing with Sean Sheffy. Fuck. <laughs> Holy shit. That's so I remember crazy. being like, starting to also feel like, man, you know, this is, am I going to be able to keep up with everything all the time? Like it was right. just, that's just not why I was skating, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so 
so I think part of that was another reason why I kind of was like, I don't know if I want to be pro. Like, I don't know if that's mm. the lifestyle I want to do and, and everything. Well, what was it like when the video came out um, for you personally? Was it like, did it change? Like, were your peers like your, cause I know that like for my experience, when, just something simple, like I remember the uh, no comply kickflip. We had never seen that until that video came out. And we're like, is this video shopped? Like, is this real? Like, how do they, you can't do that, can you? And so I'm, I'm just, uh, from my perspective, you being in that video, are the kids in your neighborhood or like just, are you getting more notoriety? Is people like treating you differently? Like, are you getting like, you know, like how, how was that? It was definitely bizarre. Um, so one thing I remember was the, so they filmed, we filmed all the stuff. I do remember when I, like when we went into Jeff Pettit's house after we filmed the, the ramp stuff and Dave was showing us uh, the stuff he had videoed uh -huh. and I saw that he had filmed that last thing over the ladder. Uh -huh. I was like, wow. I was like, I remember feeling like this is so cool. It's been captured. Uh -huh. Cause we had so many great skate days and doing crazy stuff that was never captured. And I was like, wow, it's really, I'm really glad this got captured, but I didn't really know how far the video was going to go around, you know, when it finally came out, you know, once they produced it and put it out, uh, I was blown away. Cause I remember I went to San Diego for the grand opening, you know, for the, uh, you know, the first showing the premiere, oh, there was a premiere in San Diego. There was a premiere. Yeah. There was oh, a premiere sick. in San Diego and like in a um, theater and a theater and Rad. everything. And uh, there was one guy, I don't remember his name now. There was one guy. Was that I don't remember. for Hocus Pocus or Shackle Me Not? This was for Shackle Me Not. This oh. was the, so this for Shackle Me Not. So this was the first H Street video. Uh -huh. Not really, people didn't really know H Street that well until right. the video came out, right? Uh -huh. uh, so we, but, but Paternaski set up a premiere and, uh, you know, I remember being in the theater and just being super jazzed to see the whole thing start and everything. And I see myself going down the railing. I think one of the first shots it was, and I was like, holy crap, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and uh, so and then I think, th so there was a guy that was always a dick to me. I don't remember who it was, or he was always <laughs> giving me crap. Uh -huh. uh, like when I go to San Diego and skate with people. And team? I remember when I ollied over the ladder, he got up out of the audience and looked at me and went, holy shit, dude. <laughs> I was like, oh, I finally, I guess I gained his respect. After that, he was super nice to me all the time. <laughs> I don't think he even really knew me. Like, wow. he was just really funny. And then I'll always remember this. After that video, Danny Way said I was his favorite st street skater. No way. And I was like, oh, my God. And Danny Way was a little kid, man. Sure. He was just a little kid at that time, but he was so amazing. And so yeah. I was like, there's no way I'm living up to this, dude. I'm like, you don't even know. There's no way I can live up to that. <laughs> you met all these people and had relationships with them all? Yeah, I mean, I'd see them all down. I mean, I didn't know, like, Danny that well because we didn't go – I didn't go skate vert with – so Danny would hang out with Tony, and they'd be going to a vert ramp. And I didn't, mm. you know, and I would go and hang out with Hensley and Steve Ortega. You know, I, I got to go down there and skate with those guys. There's stuff that we all did that never got filmed. Like right after the first H Street video, when it blew up and everyone was watching it and all that stuff, uh -huh. I came down and uh, skated with Steve Ortega and Hensley. We didn't have any cameras and we did all kinds of stuff in Vista. I remember jumping these huge channels and doing railings. None of that stuff was ever filmed. Mm. Um, it was just super fun to skate with those guys. They were awesome. And I, I, I definitely, you know, I was, I was super impressed by all those Vista skaters. Like it was, there was definitely a mix of like the Northern California guys were kind of the, do the big gaps and the gnarly stuff. Mm -hmm. And the Vista guys were all tricks. They would always do these little weird flip tricks with their tails and stepping off the board and, and, uh, 360 ollies and stuff like that. And, uh, I remember Tanaski was like, he was always trying to get us to sort of merge the two things. Like 
that's where sort of doing, can you do a 360 ollie over a massive gap now? Right. You know? uh, so it was, it was fun to skate with those guys and try to kind of learn the tricky, the tricky stuff. Yeah. Uh, like flat ground tricks or whatever, flat ground runs, what they used to call them, where they do trick after trick after trick. Uh-huh. Uh, and I remember Ternaski's, you know, saying, hey, you guys should uh, try to put things together. I mean, there was a shot in the, in Shackle Me Not where I think I do the railing and then I kick flip off the curb. And part of that was Ternaski always like, hey, you know, stick your tricks together. So I, I got to skate with those guys before and after Shackle Me Not. They were, and uh, he was kind of trying to get the, you know, he was always like, let's get the NorCal guys to push the Southern California guys and, and back and forth. You know, let's get the Southern California guys to push the NorCal guys to do some technical stuff sure. instead of just hucking it off big things. And, you know, how would you so. feel when you would get together with like a Matt Hensley though? Are you feeling like his equal or like, Jesus Christ, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> well, early on, early on, I did, uh, as time went on, I think I was like, this guy's amazing because Hensley would land fucking everything. Uh -huh. So I think early on, he was more in awe of me because I was jumping off huge stuff and uh -huh. he didn't do that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, so that's why I say it was a good, it was a kind of a good uh, collaboration because, uh, you know, they had respect for me doing long railings and jumping off stuff. And I had respect for them because they do all these technical things and then like, doing a rail slide to grind, like all that kind of stuff. Like I had never thought of rail sliding and then slapping your truck on. Yeah. I remember when they invented that thing. Uh, I remember seeing the, the, some of the shots for that because Ternaski would also sh send us clips or we, somehow we would see video clips and be like, or he would tell us on the phone, you know, Matt just did this thing. And uh, so we it's definitely pushed fire each you other. up. Like, yeah. hey, you better step it up. Look what That's right. I did. Yeah. Wait till the next video comes out. That's what he'd say. <laughs> oh, shit. So, uh, so I do remember. Time. Yeah, I do remember. Uh, I mean, I was good friends with those guys. I, I definitely love skating with them. But I, the thing about Hensley, I definitely started to feel like, you know, this guy lands every trick, you know, mm -hmm. and, and as he started to progress and make things bigger. Um, he just, he was so good at landing everything. And I would always like, I had a hard time just sticking, st like he was just always, he'd just get stuff completely dialed and he could do it every time. Right. I was more of a, you know, I'd go for some big crazy thing and then if I made it, maybe I'd do it one other time and I was yeah. like, you know, I did it. <laughs> I mean, he's one so. of the most influential street skaters, if not skateboarder period, like of all time. Yeah. And he, and he made all kinds of tricks up. I remember when he made up the thing where he would grab his nose and flip his board 360 and land on it. He was telling us about that one. Huh. Uh, then he did that 180 kickflip to backside grab. Uh, oh. Like yeah. over the garbage can. Over the garbage can. Uh, yeah. That was like, I was like, man, these guys are just kicking ass. It's, so when you so. went to the premiere to see the video, you were seeing it all for the first time. Yeah, yeah. None of us had seen it all clipped together. It was so a that, total surprise. That's amazing, too. You know? And then, yeah. like, you had asked me, like, how did it affect me? Well, I go to Benicia or something, skate park, and people right. would be like, that's Ray Simmons. That's Ray Simmons. And they're like, can I get your autograph? And I was just like, whoa, this is really weird, you know? And then... Uh, did you get asked to do things and stuff? Like, hey, do the Benny Hanna or whatever. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> People would say weird names for stuff too, uh, and I wouldn't know what they were talking. <laughs> They'd be like, "Do the what you call it thing," and I'd be like, "Uh, uh I don't know what that is." But you mean the forward ollie? <laughs> <laughs> the forward ollie, the ollie to grab. But one thing that's really wild is, throughout all these years since that video, uh, I'll meet people. And they're like, whoa, it's, you know, whoa, it's Ray Simmons. And they're all like weirded out that like there's a guy local in Boulder who has a skate, like a indoor skate park thing. Uh -huh. I took my son there to go skating with, for a birthday party. Yeah. And then the guys were like, dude, that's, that's, you know, it's Ray Simmons. Holy crap. You know, and they remember the video. Uh, I once went to Finland on a scientific conference. Wow. And I, I met a, I met a guy there. I was out uh, on a dock and these guys were, it was like 11 p.m. It's Finland, you know, in the summer, it stays light forever. 
Yeah. And, and these guys were uh, wakeboarding. And they came in and I started asking them about wakeboarding and stuff. And then I said, yeah, I used to skate a lot, blah, blah, blah. And this guy named Temu was like, uh, oh, yeah, I used to skate. And I said, oh, yeah, I used to skate. I, I was in the A Street video. And then he was like, no way. And I'm like, yeah. he's like, who are you? And I said, I was Ray Simmons. And he was like, no way. <laughs> All my friends used to watch that video. And I'm like, wait, we're in Finland. <laughs> I was like, I can't believe it, you know. That's so awesome. I mean, I don't want to sound crazy, but there's never going to be a hocus pocus or a shackle me not again. Those videos are so fucking legendary and instrumental for a period of time that we'll never duplicate either. I mean, at that time, what you guys were introducing to the world was something that would inspire everyone to keep the longevity that it's had. You can never take those away. I, I, I bet any country you go to, somebody's going to be like Ray Simmons, 8th Street. Yeah, duh. Like, yeah, you know what wild. I mean? I think it's, yeah, it's it's why you're here, man. I, we had to hunt you down. <laughs> you're like the uh, Sasquatch. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, it was, it was uh, it's pretty cool that they were able to distribute that all over the place and so many people I can't imagine now how fast when someone does, does a new trick, Rona and I were talking about this too. Like back then we, you know, we, we would do tricks. We never, we, we didn't see anything. We'd come up with stuff that we hadn't seen, but you don't know if not as is doing it or Mark right. Gonzalez until it hits the mag. Yeah. You don't know what people are doing. And, and now everyone's got their phone. Like you could do a new trick post it on YouTube or Instagram. And uh -huh. suddenly everyone's seen that trick, you know? And, uh, I mean, the progression must be insane now, <sighs> you know? Yeah. It's really crazy. It is wild. Well, um, Ron it's told fun. me to ask you if you remember, he said it took you 15 to 20 minutes one time to make a paper airplane and you guys were in Ohio and you threw it out a window or something. It flew for like the longest time. He's like, he's like a rocket scientist putting this fucking airplane together. I remember that. That's really <laughs> funny that he remembers that. I remember putting that thing together and chucking it and the thing just floated and just went and it flew like, block after block and then went around the building like oh. i was like holy crap <laughs> that's pretty funny that oh, he remembers man. that yeah ron's so great so just to catch us up what 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 is life like now what are you doing so well this is the the ironic thing is uh i um you know they called me a mad scientist i'm not mad but i'm still a scientist oh. uh so after after i messed up my knee I then um, wait. Started. Are you creating a waterbed car? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's too dangerous. <laughs> I uh, I went back to school. I and I started studying more and started figuring out how to take tests and and do all that stuff because uh -huh. um, I always thought I wanted to do like engineering or build stuff. Uh, so I ended up doing physics. And uh, from Santa Barbara City College, I transferred to Berkeley, and I got a physics degree at Berkeley, and then I stayed for a PhD. So, oh. so I got a doctorate in physics, nice. um, and I started studying something called superfluid helium, and another thing called the Josephson effect in helium, which uh, it's, it's a way of making uh, helium flow through these tiny little holes, and it does some very strange stuff but it can allow you to make a gyroscope that's super sensitive. So I built a gyroscope for my graduate research that measured the rotation of the earth, uh, which seems a little, you know, we know the earth rotating, but I was in the second basement of a building, you know, completely isolated. And I would rotate this little loop in my lab. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I'm, and, and it's also cryogenic. It's at like 20 millikelvin, which is 0 0.02 Kelvin. And Kelvin is uh, a temperature scale that follows Celsius, but absolute zero is absolute zero on that scale. Like that's when everything stops. Nothing does anything. Uh -huh. So and, and for that experiment, actually, we were at like uh, 0.0001 Kelvin, super insanely cold. 
colder oh. than anything. And it makes this fluid into something called a superfluid. Okay. Um, but and then I could measure the, ra r the rotation of the earth by changing the orientation in the laboratory. So I got into all that. I got into physics and, and, and got my graduate degree. And then, um, then from, th from the physics I learned there, I moved to superconductors. And I moved out here to Colorado, and I work at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Oh. And I'm an experimental physicist. And with those, that Josen effect thing, uh, you can make special circuits uh, that allows you to uh, build something called a quantum computer. And I don't know if you've heard about that stuff in the press, but Google just put something out uh, in the last few months about... Uh, making a machine that's that showed quantum supremacy, which basically says that if you make a circuit a uh, computer out of these circuits that have a special quantum property mm -hmm. uh, and I can say more about that if you want me to, but it basically means that you can start to do calculations that are literally impossible on a regular computer. It would take the age of the universe to actually do the calculations oh and uh, and these uh these circuits make it possible to do things that you could never do with a regular computer. And, and my old advisor, when I came to Colorado, a guy named John Martinez was my postdoc advisor, and I started doing research with him. And I stayed here at the laboratory. He went to UC Santa Barbara and then got hired by Google and built this huge machine. And uh, so that's still what I'm working on. I'm still working on the, the parts to build a quantum computer. Oh, wow. Figuring out how to get that to work right. In a way, when I was skateboarding, I liked coming up with new tricks and trying things. And like, I tried to figure out how to flip the boards and do stuff uh, uh -huh. in a new way. And it was fun to do things no one else had done. Like if you did Absolutely. some huge channel or some, some other weird trick. And in a way, doing physics was kind of like that. Building a new experiment, no one's ever done that experiment before, and it's, it's fun to do something totally new. Nice. So. Okay, sick. I was waiting for you to say you were going to cure COVID somehow. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, IBM is also trying to make a quantum computer, and they have said that if they can do molecular simulations with the quantum computer, they could help solve uh, viruses and things. Wow. So, well, so it's possible. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this whole situation, this pandemic era? Like as, a, as being in science and stuff, what can you say about it? Well, uh, I mean, I think people should definitely listen to the scientists. And, uh, and when they do predictions, they usually try to predict on the, the, the worst side, like the, the worst case scenario. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, sometimes people say, oh, you know, all their simulations, they were way overblown, you know, and part of that is because they're looking at worst case scenarios and they're also looking at, um, they're also trying to, uh, you know, make sure they don't undercut it so that you, you know, people get hurt. Uh, and then if people are taking the advice, which they did, it makes things better. So it's part of the reason things turned out better is because they actually, uh, people change their behavior. Mm -hmm. And now that we have all this data, I'm sure they'll be able to fit better models to whatever's going on. Right. Um, but I, I, my personal opinion about the COVID thing is I think it's not as bad as a war because we're not blowing up buildings. Right. Um, so I think the economy will come back pretty quick once we can do stuff. I think what sucks is that it puts people out of work, whereas a regular war, everyone would work even harder building tanks and bombs and whatever it kind of stirs the economy. It's uh -huh. in this case, it's kind of doing the opposite. Mm. Um, but I don't know. I, I feel like it, I think things will, are going to work out, but you know, people have been warning about this kind of stuff for a long time. And you know, it's, it's hard for human beings to, to be ready for something that they can't see or feel or right. You know what I mean? It's just like someone getting really scared or upset. And yet, you just don't know it until it happens. And then you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> now we got to do something about it. Yeah, it's wild. Like, it's, it's, I was talking to my friend this morning. I was like, it's been three months. It feels like a year, but it also feels like a weekend. 
Like it's like, it's, it's really crazy. Like yeah. the uncertainty always brings up fear and all that stuff. Are you, what part of Colorado are you, are you in Denver or where are you? So I'm in Boulder, Colorado. Boulder. You know Boulder? Yeah, it's totally. It's like 30 minutes from Denver. Uh, and are yeah. you guys um, dealing with lockdown? They've, uh, yeah, most people are still at home. They've eased the restrictions. Um, you know, they used to say you can only go out for exercise. Uh -huh. uh, now some businesses are open and people are out doing things. But for the most part, people are still pretty good about wearing masks and taking it easy. I think the college group, the college crew at, at uh, you know, CU Boulder, they're, they kind of, you know, half of them aren't doing caring at all. They're just doing whatever. Well, and you know? then, um, so. you know, after the George Floyd incident, we're having all these, I don't know about you guys, but in San Francisco, for sure, tons of protests and huge gatherings of people, which is, it's confusing to see like social distancing. And then the next day, all these people together and like lots of them aren't wearing masks as well. And it's just like, What's going on? What in the hell is going on? I know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy to have all the pandemic stuff happening and then all the protests happening at the same time. It's, uh, it's probably not good. Like, yeah. uh, I don't know how, I, I wonder if we're going to see a kick up in all the COVID stuff because everybody's, uh, that's what I'm wondering, you know, moving together. And I, I think there's probably a good chance of that. Um, do you Plus, you don't want to mess with an exponential function, you know. Sorry. When stuff's exponential going up, it's like, Excuse me, it's Ray. brutal. Really cool hearing your story, catching up. No, you're up. welcome. Yeah, I got, I got more story, too many stories. And, uh, you know, I, I give a big shout out to uh, Tony Magnuson, too. He's, uh, he's, I'm really glad that he got H Street back up and running. They're still selling boards. I don't know if you knew that. Hensley's still involved. They're making boards. I want to go down there and see Hensley again. I haven't seen Hensley in so many years. Ah. You know, it would be really cool to see all those guys again. You've uh, never gone to see Floggy Molly or anything? No. No, oh. I know his band's so huge. I've never seen his band. Yeah, yeah. You know, I want to get down there and see all those guys again. It's, you know. I've just been in a totally different world, you know? Totally. So, Well, stay healthy. Um, I was going to say that was something that we didn't really um, touch on, but the H Street video soundtracks are huge for me and my generation of people that, like, grew up with that video. Like, we still listen to, like, a lot of that stuff. And I think, like, Jeff Clint was in one of the bands. Yeah, um, yeah. Could you talk about that? Like, what were, were the music? Was it all Ternansky? Was he, or like, how did that all happen? Well, here's I, I love the part where they're skating the, uh, I think it's the Santa Clara skate park where you're talking about, and it's like, my, 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 Matt, 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 Matt Hensley, like Tony Mag, Tony Mag. Oh, know? yeah. It was like, <laughs> I think Ron Allen probably had part to do with it too. Like, he's musically inclined. Ron Allen had a band. So his songs in there during his part. Mm -hmm. um, some of the songs that are during during uh, Jeff and, and and my part were, I was working at that gas station that's in the video. Two of the guys that worked at the gas station had an old band, and so those guys said, "Hey, we ha we have a band, you know, you know." And they had music; they played their music for me, and so I said, "Hey, do you guys want to?" And so I gave the music to Ternasky. So he put, so some of the music in, from our section is from the band that worked at the gas station. In Marin? Um, in Marin, yeah. Bad. And Art Godoy had a band. The Art Godoy and his brother, Godoy Brothers, had a band. Steve Ortega still plays with the Godoys. Oh, really? Uh, but all that music was collected, I think. Uh, it was j collected up, just like all the skaters. Like, a lot of the skaters on the team were just, you know, Mike saw them skate, thought that was awesome. He talked to Tony, they put him on the team. Right. You know, it was so cool. It was, I kind of felt like Powell, Powell was awesome, but Powell was like so crisp and clean and like they had money and they made things in a very particular way and style was very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, A Street was much more just like whatever, you know, if, if what you're doing is awesome, you're part, you're on the team, you're part of the whole thing, you know? Right. It was way more grassroots almost. 
One, one other person I wanted to give a frat, uh, shout out to is Frankie Hill. Shout out. Uh, when I moved to Santa Barbara, I met Frankie Hill and started skating with Frankie. I don't know. We had a good connection somehow. Frankie and I had a lot of fun skating. You know, he was also into doing big tricks and jumping off stuff. And I remember he one time he was asking me, how do you make up tricks? Like, how do you do stuff? And I was like, oh, well, you just, I just sort of fling the board in the air and do something weird with my feet and then watch what happens and see if <laughs> there's a way to land on it again. Uh -huh. um, and I was like, here, check this out. And I did some weird thing. And I, I can't remember if that turned into like, it turned into some weird 360 front side flip thing. And he was like, whoa, how do, you know, that's crazy. And I'm like, yeah, dude, those guys in San Diego, that's, they just start doing crazy stuff and you get, end up with these tricks come out of it. You know, <laughs> I, I only read all this on the internet, but Tr Ternaski supposedly went to Rodney Mullen and said, uh, cause I guess Rodney was sort of hadn't really, wasn't street skating freestyle kind of died and he wasn't sure what to do. This was what I had heard. Mm -hmm. And then he, uh, Ternaski was like, come on, man, you should try to do tricks or start skating with him. And then, uh, he started doing all these insane street tricks on his street board. And yeah. I wish I could have skated with him at that time. Cause I was always trying to do, I once had a list. I might even have it in a box. I had a list of tricks. Once I was doing shove it and a kick flip this way and a 180, I would start, I started trying to make a little language for the tricks oh. it had little symbols and stuff because i started putting all this stuff together i'm like you could do like a bazillion different kinds of tricks if you can uh figure out how to just flip your board this way and do a 180 or a 360 or right and uh and rodney mullen like i mean once he started skating street it was just unbelievable and my, here my son is trying to make up a, a trick in his mind and he said what you could ollie up grab it and flip the board and I think uh, he did do that. Didn't he do a trick where he half all he flips, grabs the board, and then flipped it some more and landed yeah. on it? Yeah, yep. I mean, I, I once was trying to figure out how to make an ollie go higher by half flipping the board so it was on the top of my feet, then lift it up even higher, oh. and then try to flip it back over again. <laughs> but, but I could never seem to get it to work. But, <laughs> but I, I also, like messing around i figured out how to do that front foot impossible thing uh -huh. and people used to say something about that somebody named it i don't even know what that thing's called it might be uh, but, the front foot impossible but other people have done it and i i'd never seen anyone do that thing before let's uh, give some shout out so i think i'll start with uh some uh, marin people some old marin people that i skated with mike lucaccini shout out some quarter madera boys Trent, Seth, and Paul. Shout out. You know, Noah Slaznik. I wish Shout he was still with, with, with us. Aaron Vincent. Shout out. Brian New. Shout out. Jerry Thompson. Shout out. Uh, Alessandro. Shout out. Uh, Joel Doherty. Sodic. Shout out. Mark Henderson. Shout Greg out. Greg Loyacano from the Mother Hips. Shout out. Justin Her Herwick. Shout out. Um, you knew somebody in the Mother Hips? Yeah. Greg Loyacano. I think my friend was Guitarist. the drummer. Really? Chris French, who I think I read on in some Instagram post somewhere, someone said Ray would flip out when he gets super mad, couldn't make a trick, and he sawed his board in half. That was not me. <laughs> that was not me. That was our friend Chris French. Shout that out. was not an easy operation. We're like, he like couldn't make a trick, and he's like, I'm so pissed. He had to go, he had to open the garage door, go in the garage, pull out a hat, like a he pulled out like a reciprocating saw or like a jigsaw, had to plug it in, had to get a cord. And the whole time we're like, dude, just calm down. And he's like, no, this board's dead. <laughs> and he just started sawing and he had to saw through rails too. That How was cool. not me. <laughs> uh, it is true that one time I was at uh, Benicia and I, I failed on that middle hump. And I freaked out and I warned everyone and I said, I'm going to chuck my board. <laughs> and I threw my board as hard as I could to that. There's that little bank where everyone waits on top to roll down, to go and hit the humps on the side. And my board went yeah. flying, spinning down and went flying up that thing. Everyone scattered. <laughs> so I, I apologize to all you people out there. I was 
at least I warned you, I didn't want to kill anybody. I was pretty good friends with Greg Carroll too, long before he took over Venture Trucks. Like I read all this stuff about him recently and what happened to him. And, yeah. And, and uh, I haven't kept up with Mike Carroll. I mean, my, when I think of Mike Carroll, I still picture a little kid. Mike was awesome. I mean, yeah. he, was, he, was, he was also another guy that I could tell was going to be just super good. I'm sure Mike has, he has a story of me. Uh, I was trying to ollie off the, the center island in uh, Embarcadero Center off the middle. Uh -huh. And I remember that, um, and he didn't know, I, I had my board up at the top of that thing and I was way far away about to run and I had to run up all the steps, jump on my board and then try to ollie that whole thing. And he was like doing grinds down there. And I think I ran up there. I got all the way up there. I was riding off and I ollied and he came along to grind and I kicked my board out of the way and I yelled at him really bad. I was like, dude, what are you doing? You're going to get killed. Cause I was so freaked out. I thought I was going to kill the guy. Oh shit! And I remember he was really, uh, he was really mad at me for that. He was like, you are such a dick man. you were such a jerk. And, uh, I'm like, dude, I thought I was going to kill you. <laughs> That's why I yelled at him so bad. He was just a kid at that point, you know, trying right. to smith grind that thing. So, and then I, you know, I think Jeff and Pat Duffy for, for helping get, get this going. I also shout out to Shane Reuter. Shout out. I, I mean, I don't do social media much, but he's always on Instagram setting the history straight. I wanted to shout out to the Vista guys, Steve Ortega. Shout out. Um, when I first went down to uh, San Diego to skate with Hensley and Ortega and those guys, I think it was after the first H Street video because I met those guys through that whole thing. Um, even though I think we might have seen them at skate camp, I didn't really know them at mm. that time. It wasn't really until uh, after Shackle Me Not that I uh, kind of met those guys. But Steve was super nice, and Steve let me stay at his house. You know, oh, nice. He didn't even know me, and uh, he picked me up. His friends picked me up in this beat up Honda with a little donut, like a spare tire on the back. And they drove me at like 120 miles an hour back to their house. I thought I was going to die. And then I also forgot to mention Brian Lottie, Colby Carter. Shout out. Those guys were great. And I said Joel Rona, who I've known since kindergarten. I think I've known that dude longer than anybody else. Huh. He helped out a lot with me remembering anything. And Phil Chen. Shout and out. And Ray Meyer. Shout I out. used to skate with those guys. You know? Ray had a mini ramp in his backyard that ended up in my backyard. No way. <laughs> yeah. Did he skate that thing on his uh, freestyle board and do like... You'd have to ask Bryce. He never skated it when we went over there, but I can't imagine him not trying a little bit or something. Yeah, he must have done something. Yeah. Do like a handstand grind. I also wanted to uh, thank, you know, I think Mike Ternaski is not here to hear that, but he's a remarkable dude and, and uh, really pushed a lot of us. Mm. And I thank Ron Allen Shout out. Who, for sponsoring me and for um, pushing me also. I looked up to Ron. Ron was a, like a great man. <sighs> he was always calm when stuff was crazy. Uh, he was always supportive. Um, yeah, Ron's making a little graphic for me. Um, he's doing like a little Chuck Treese talking Schmidt graphic I'm pretty excited about. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, Ron's the best. And then I also have to give a shout out to Tony Magnuson. Shout out. He was always super nice, really supportive. I think in, in Hocus Pocus, he does a ollie flip to grab on vert. And I remember we were, t we, we were talking about that stuff, like, could you do it on vert and all that? And I remember when he did it, he's like, wait till you see this, man. You're going to be stoked. <laughs> uh, vert always pushed street skating people to do, like, even hand plants, right? That was because of vert. I was so depressed during the hand plant phase of street skating. Oh, yeah, like street plants. Mike V. Because I couldn't do that at all, man. I <laughs> sucked at that. I'm like, if this is the way it's going... I have no career in skateboarding. <laughs> <laughs> so I just couldn't do that stuff. Gabe, if you're listening, Gabe Morford, you have so many awesome photographs oh, yeah. from, from back then. Like, I don't even know if he's, how he could even like save all the, Joel and I were both talking about this. Rona, like, Gabe, how, how could you store all these uh you know, all the films and all the, uh, the negatives, the negatives for all this stuff. And 
and like organize it and remember what year this happened and that happened. I mean, he had so many good photos. Uh, I mean, a big shout out to Gabe. I mean, he's, you know, he's the man, but he was pro photographer when we were just kids. Like he should have just sent his stuff to Thrasher mm. uh, back then. Cause he has so many good photographs. Like he was totally pro and it took him a while to even break into the whole industry. Scott Thompson Potty. Shout out. Remember Potty? Yeah, we used to stay sure. at his house, man. Scotty Potty. He was awesome. I we one of my favorite nights of skating was uh we stayed at his house and we like went down the street to some parking lot at like one in the morning with all these orange sulfur lights and there was like a little like a little Ollie lump and then a huge like island and you could fly over the whole island. Like that was one of my funnest nights was like 180 over that thing or Ollie flip over and it was just super fun. He, he was a really nice guy to, to, to uh, have us come out there. All, like a lot of us, he like piled us all in his house. And I think, I think that was it. The only other thing I wanted to say is I still skate. Good I to still hear. skate. I got, uh, but I, I, I have diversified. I have uh, surf skates with the weird swivel truck. Ah. Carver, have you ever ridden one of those things? No. You should check it out. It's very bizarre. <laughs> Do they got a, a slam section? I usually like watching slam sections of these <laughs> other other type of board things. Like, oh, you do the unawheel? Where's your slam section? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think they've got probably got some pretty good slam sections. Because <laughs> I've slammed on that thing. Like, the truck can twist so far that you just go down. Right. Uh, and then uh, I ride electric skateboards. So now you can get uh, you can get light boards that have motors on them. You can still ollie and stuff. So I still have this uh, dream of putting a small motor on a street board and doing a wall ride, but you can accelerate up the wall because oh. you have a motor. You could never do that with a regular skateboard. You think you so. could do a jump ramp with it? Oh yeah, you could power. I mean, this thing goes like but 30 miles an hour. Would it take the impact? At least a few times. I'm I'm saying uh, we, we might have to get the ladder back out. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Cool. cool, cool man. It was really a pleasure catching up and uh, hearing some of your stories. I really appreciate you taking the time and stuff. Hopefully, this COVID stuff. Do you think that there's? What do you think the chances are of like a uh, vaccine? Is it? it's going to happen, but it's going to take tons of time or it's high. Like, what are your thoughts? Well, I think, um, I think there's a good chance for a vaccine, uh, only because the whole world is working on it. Like insanely. I mean, everyone it's affecting the whole world. It, this is like historical, right? We've never right. had anything this big with the world so connected and having the whole world and affected. I mean, Brazil's going nuts right now. I think yeah. there's a, a lot more places it's going to get really bad before it gets better. And mm -hmm. uh, so the whole world's working on it. I think they'll probably get a vaccine sooner than they've gotten a vaccine with anything else. Unless for some reason, like with AIDS, that you can't really make the biologically, it doesn't work. The vaccine's super hard to make. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, though, they'll probably at least work super hard on all these other drugs that at least mitigate all the you know, your symptoms and everything else. So, I mean, with the whole world hammering at this thing, I think it should be, it should happen a lot sooner than uh, other problems that we've had. So I'm still pretty optimistic that they're going to figure something out. And, um, you know, once we get a, our handle on it, everything will go back and hopefully people will still remember, remember this, you know, they don't just forget about it and be like, Oh, well now we're fine. Yeah. You no, know, because it can happen again. You know, sure. if there's another strain of the virus or a mutation, it could just happen again. But hopefully everyone will be super prepared and know what to do. Because if everyone kicked in right away, um, I think, uh, you know, it wouldn't have spread like crazy. You're right. And hopefully that every country now knows that we're, you know, we're really a global society. And if, if something goes wrong in one country, that government doesn't try to hide it or, or, uh, you know, wait, wait a while. Cause they don't want to say anything. They right. should immediately say, look, we've got something weird. We're shutting down everything right now. Yeah. Uh, 
and stop flights and everything. Don't be afraid to kill the economy. You know, it's going to come back. Well, thank you for doing the interview. I really appreciate it. And uh, shout out to uh, anybody I know who, who remembers those days. You know, it would be fun to reconnect with people in SF and uh, the whole skate community. I don't know if there are people do like historical get togethers. You know, it's been 30 years, I think, since all this stuff. I don't know. Maybe I should get on some sort of a uh, uh, social media site and uh, try to reconnect with people. I mean, I've seen some Instagram posts and stuff like that, but I haven't really. I don't know if right now is the time to introduce yourself to it. <laughs> it's really, it's almost the best time not to be on there, actually. Well, big shout out to Jeff Pettit, Pat Duffy, Ron Allen, and Gabe Morford. Shout Gabe out. was the one that kind of connected with somebody who got your information so that I could contact you. And then Pat and uh, Jeff and Ron helped me with uh, some of the history and some of the questioning. So I, those are the homies. I appreciate them big time. Cool. I, I need to interview Gabe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you oh. should definitely interview Gabe. I think the multitude of stories that guy has, there's probably no way to capture it all. And I don't know if Gabe's the type of guy that really wants to talk about himself either. So Yeah, uh, he was always pretty quiet. Shout out to Rob Welsh. Shout out. For making this happen. Yes, Rob, I give you a huge shout out. I think Pat told me that you and Pat would watch the video like repeatedly, the Shackle Me Not video to like see what was going on in there. So thanks. For, I really appreciate you guys uh, d doing that. You know, it's, it's been super fun reminiscing and remembering all, all this, all these days. I mean, skateboarding was super important in my life to get me to have self-confidence and to, uh, I mean, I was thinking about it when I was angry, I would skate. When I was sad, I would, I would go skating. When I was super excited and happy, I'd go skating. All right, well, thanks so much. I appreciate it. It's yeah. fun to relive the, uh, the old times. I, it was uh, definitely uh, one of the funnest times of my life, for sure. Thank you for listening to another episode of Talking Schmidt. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Anchor, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. When you subscribe, you'll get notifications every Tuesday of new episodes the minute they become available. Also, please leave reviews and a five-star rating. It's the best way to help the show grow. All of the episodes will always remain free, but if you would like to help support the show, you can do so at TalkingSchmidt.com, where you can pick up some merchandise like t-shirts, beanies, hats, and stickers. The website has an entire archive of all of the episodes, with extra photos and videos. Email us with any suggestions, comments, or ways that the show may have improved your life at TalkingSchmidt at gmail.com. All interviews are conducted, edited, and produced by Schmitty. The intro music is Mary's Cross by the band Nature. A very special shout-out goes to the executive director, Cheryl Camisa. Shout-out. Love it! This is Talking Schmidt, where the Rolodex is deep, but the conversation is deeper.